Uh, my name is Nahid Khuzaymet, and today is January 23rd, 2.30 p.m. We have the quorum. Meeting is in order. We're going to start with board of canvases. We have some uh, reject ballot we have to discuss. So I would like to get the motion to open the board of canvases. I move we open the board of canvassers. I'll second. Second. Those in favor of this motion? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Aye. So, where are the? Where are many? So you can you can tell. Well, yeah, twelve of them. Just on time, please. Yes. Can I present for a because I cannot find you. Uh, we have received More untimely. We have received twelve untimely ballots that we are presenting to the board of canvassers to, to consider and uh, reject. Uh, seven of them are Yulkavas and five are domestic. Out of seven Yulkavas, three were postmarked by uh, the election day. And out of five domestics, only one was postmarked by election day. Would I have a motion to reject them? Yeah, I move reject. We reject these untimely ballots. As we reject these ballots as being untimely. I'll second. Thank you. Those in favor of the rejection. Aye. 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 Opposed. Thank you very much. Now I need a motion to close the board of canvas and go to the public meeting. Yeah, I move we close the canvas and move to our. Regularly scheduled board meeting. I'll second. Thank you. The meeting is in order. Yes. The Alex has showed up too. Alex is here too because he, he doesn't have a computer. All right. Hello, Thank everyone. you, Alex. All right. I'm sorry. Board president, I'm... remark. I just thank you all, you guys and the staff, Canvas Walker, for that difficult years which we had. We did it. Thank you so much. Addition and change it to the agenda. I have a question about anybody want to change the agenda? Yes, yes, David. Um, I just have a question, uh, uh, Mr. Naiman. I'm sorry, uh, you're very low. No one it's can hear faint. you. I have a hard time hearing too, David. Right. Let's see if I can do something. Yes, yeah, start over, David. I think it's his speakers. Is this better or worse? Yes. Better. better, much better. Yes, better. Okay, I guess I, I guess I won't be using these earbuds today. Um, so um, Boris sent out to the board a list of uh, suggestions for legislative items, and I just wanted to make sure that that's going to be included in our new business today. Yes, it is. It is included. Okay, thank you. That's all I had. Thank you. Do you see the now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You're dead. Yes, David. Thank you. Any okay. other? Suggestion and whatever we forget is going to be under new business or old business. So, one of these two, we will cover them anyhow. All right, Addition. disclosure of campaign. I mean, we are not giving money to anybody. Go ahead, anybody is rich enough to give money away? <laughs> I think all of us are rich enough to give money away, uh, Nahid. Um, you know, <laughs> average contributions have gone way down. $25 for many people. All right. Okay. Thank you. Public comment, Lisa. Um, Ms. President, I believe Barbara Sanders submitted something for the record. I don't know if Barbara Sanders would like to address the board at this time or just her. The gentleman. Her, have, her letter. We, have we received it? It just came in right before the meeting. We have not had a chance to send it out yet. Okay. She has some such. Ms. Sanders, do you want to raise your hand or are you, did you want to address the board? I just wanted to um, have it listed for the board at a later time. I can't, I'm not in a place where I can give testimony. Okay, then we will add it. To so we'll send, send it, we'll distribute it to this to the board to review and then address it yeah. because we, at the next meeting. We, we will certainly read it, Barbara. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? No one else has submitted anything. I saw Mr. Record. Fletcher. Is that Mr. Fletcher? Mr. Fletcher. Mr. Fletcher, would you like to address the board at this time? Just go ahead and raise your hand and we'll have um, Mr. Corshi unmute you. Okay, then. Whenever she Just comes second, later, yeah. we would. You might be prompted to unmute yourself. He, he's saying he's, I think, I think he's saying he's not looking to speak. Okay. All right. Oh. He's, he, okay. He, he's okay. just, he, he looks like he's just observing. If you want to speak, just raise your hand. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Director, Mr. Director. <laughs> Jerry. Jerry, Jerry, could you please Boris. unmute Boris? You should be able to be heard from that mic. So you, you can move it around with his face. Some technical issue here. Yeah, good. But no, we have to echo. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Boris Brajkovic. I'm the new election director for the Montgomery County Board of Elections. And I will uh, today present my first report to the board. Uh, the first item is a uh, notice and the distribution of materials. Uh, we shared with the board the draft minutes for two board meetings, December 19th and December 28th. They were sent to the board on January 12th. Uh, the agenda for today's meeting also went out on January 12th with additions on it uh, added on January 19th. Uh, the director's report that I'm presenting and the an outline of the presentation that will follow later in the meeting about staff's view or staff's overview of 2022 election cycle was shared on January 19th. Uh, in regards to action items from the previous meetings, uh, the first one uh, relates to the draft outline the deputy director shared with the board that she prepared and delivered at Maryland Association of Counties on January 3rd. The presentation was on January 5th. The second item was a request from the board for the staff to review uh, percentages of voters who use BNDs in 2022 election cycle. Uh, the report states that in the primary, during early voting, wow. almost 70% of voters used BNDs. Wow. On election day, that number was 42.7%. Total for 2022 primary was 49.5% of PMD users. For the general, 61% of voters use BMDs during early voting, 26% on election day for the total of 35.4% for the general gubernatorial <laughs> elections. Uh, as a follow-up to the last board meeting, there were uh, question, uh, questions about uh, uh, personnel costs, and that email, that communication was uh, shared with the board on December 19th. The next uh, action item that board requested staff to look at was the expenditures that were financed by the Center for Tech and Civic Life, and uh, uh, the staff shared the table, which outlines uh, those expenditures, and they amount for uh, $34,000 for security cameras, $612,000, $450 election judge stipends, uh, $75,000, bit over $75,000 for IT seasonal uh, temporary team members, and uh, uh, $81,000 for the water services seasonal temporary members. The total that was financed was $801,912.50. Uh, following the board's request, uh, the staff organized a meeting with the uh, postmaster of Rockville Main Post Office. The meeting was uh, held on January 19th. It was attended by the uh, board president, board secretary, election director, and deputy, deputy uh, director. Uh, we, uh, one item that was requested by the board to, for the staff to look at that uh, relates to the 
time that is uh, uh, needed for vote by mail ballots to reach voters from the moment uh, they are mailed from by the vendor. And uh, as indicated in the last meeting, this is a data that is provided by the state board. We are communicating with them. So the moment we have it, it will be shared, shared with the board. Uh, when it comes to the personnel, uh, we are in the process of hiring uh, uh, a candidate or selecting a can candidate for the office service coordinator with the voter services position. And uh, uh, there is a number of vacant positions that will be advertised in the upcoming period. Uh, temporary positions, we are still have a number of temporary team members with us. Uh, they are filling uh, uh, for the roles, delivering the tasks that otherwise should be delivered by permanent staff members who should be appointed to the those positions that are currently currently vacant. Uh, when it comes to legislation, the Maryland General Assembly convened on January 11th and uh, we presented to the board uh, an overview of uh, election related bills that are, <clears throat> that are currently being presented. A uh, few bills uh, are referenced in the director's report. Uh, uh, House Bill 22 uh, requires signature verification and witness, witness signatures for vote by mail ballots. House Bill 35 requires photo identification proof of residency for in-person voting. Uh, House Bill 41, uh, requires establishing curbside voting. House Bill 95 requires training and signage related to accommodations for voters with disabilities. And uh, House Bill 114 allows unaffiliated voters to affiliate with a party using same day registration. House Bill 130 requires reporting and providing for the termination of contracts with election services providers for reasons related to foreign ownership and manufacture and requiring the posting of the complete text of certain ballot questions at least 65 days before general election in a manner widely accessible to the public. Uh, local bills related to the use of ranked choice voting or other alternate voting methods and inclusion of Tacoma Park municipal elections on the state ballot have been favorably reported by the education election in the housing Montgomery <clears throat> County delegation. <laughs> when it comes to the section activities, uh, we uh, we are conducting lessons learned, looking back at 2020 election cycle, uh, uh, looking at activities, uh, events, processes, anything that we can do better for the next election cycle itself. When it comes to water services. Uh, December, January, usually February itself, it's very busy time because we receive all the uh, water registration records submitted by our voters while the water registration was closed, three weeks prior to the election, all the way until the uh, certification deadline. In December, we received over 34,000 of those records that we have to, that we have to process. Uh, when it comes to IT section, IT staff is performing post-election maintenance, uh, which consists of inspecting and testing of election equipment in, in accordance with the state uh, post-election maintenance plan. Uh, this post-election maintenance uh, is being performed on 677 scanners, uh, 1,212 poll books, 1,555 poll book printers, and 861 BMDs. The operations section is, prepare, is preparing uh, all the available documents from 2022 election cycle for storage <laughs> and unvoted ballots for shredding. When it comes to upcoming uh, meetings and events, uh, the staff has scheduled uh, to conduct post election manual audit on February 13th. We will follow state procedures. The, uh, Manual audit will be conducted in the BOE sorry, building. It will be live streamed and it will be open for 
public observation. Uh, candidate filing process for 2022, 2024 election cycle will commence on February 27th. And we just wanted to uh, let board know that the annual mayor annual conference is scheduled for May 14th to May 19th this year. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Any questions for Bruce? Go ahead, Alex. So these percentage figures that you have for us, these are for um, the uh, use of the DNDs, these would be the percentage of all the people who voted in that yes. particular way, I guess, in that election. So, for, if we're, for example, 42.7% of everyone who voted early in the primary used a DND. And that's how we pulled it. Got it. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. David. Isn't David's hand up? Kevin. David's got his hand up. Um, should I go? Madam President, may I may I proceed? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, Boris, uh, just a, a couple of questions. You you mentioned the Mayo Conference. Is that the one that is required for board members or the one that is optional? It's optional one. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, he, he said that's a he said that's the that that's the option one. Thank you. Um Boris, do you have any thoughts as to for the numbers that Alex just asked you about? It seems like there's a pretty significant difference between um the primary and the general, at least where election day is concerned. Uh, um and I was wondering if you had any thoughts as to why that might be. I realize it would be just uh you know we don't necessarily know the answer but I, I was wondering if you had any any theories i don't know the exact answer to this uh but my best assumption would be that uh, the percentages are lost as the volume increases so later on when we go through the presentation staff staff presentation for the 2020 election cycle we will see that volume of the votes cast in person changed dramatically from uh, and primary to general, and this is where the percentages go down. Any other question, David? Um, I I guess I have a, a a question for board members about this Center for Tech and Civic Life grant, um, which is I was curious as to whether anyone has concerns with how that money was spent because to me it looks pretty um, non-controversial. Um, and um, I gather that uh, this is a question perhaps for staff. I gather that it's a one-time grant and that we will have to make up that $800,000 in, you know, in resources in some other way. I would, uh, if we are looking at the, the expenditures, they are reoccurring expenditures that will board will have to finance going forward in every cycle. We are talking about stipend for election judges and temporary stuff, either for IT or, or water services. So these, these costs will be with us. So one time grant. It was one time grant, but right. I'm just saying the cost that were covered with right. that grant will reappear, reappear in every election cycle. Right. In other words, we still need to do those expenditures. We have to find a different revenue source if we're not getting it from from this uh, this grant. And I hope that um, those who express concerns about this grant, I still again, I'm not sure I fully understand what the concerns were. Um, I understand that the director of the Center for Tech and Civic Life um, is a former Republican clerk in Colorado. Um, but um, I would hope that those who have concerns about it would help us to get that $800,000 from the county, uh, because that's not a small amount of money uh, for us to need, uh, you know, in order to uh, in order to finance this. Uh, Diane. Yes, I think I can respond to David's <clears throat> inquiry in that I am the board member, trying to put my hand down who raised this issue at the very beginning when I heard about CTCL. My concern was not for, and let me first say, I, I agree with the characterization. The expenditures are not a concern. They were not a question. I wanted to see how the money was spent. 
my concern was that we were able to see the documentation for the solicitation for the funds, which I still would like to see the paperwork that was used for the um, for our board to apply for the grant. And this is because <clears throat> many people who are not familiar with the nomenclature CTCL have heard of this in the news as Zuckerbucks from the Mark and Priscilla Chan um, Foundation. <clears throat> and because of all of that, that was my concern with this money. I think people who have followed the issue have seen in the news over the last couple of election or over the last couple of years that Zuckerbox um, had conditions with it. And there were some states where the money it seemed was used specifically for a certain demographic or political party in certain states. So I am delighted to see our paperwork and our accounting and how well our board did, but I still would like to see, and my original concern only was always, were there stipulations that may have been in the, or conditions that may have been in the, um, the, the, the paperwork for the application. So without belaboring it, does that satisfy anybody's questions? Just want to make sure, Diane, that you're going to be helping us to get the replacement funding for the $800,000. Well, if I am honored to be around during that, during that cycle, I would work very hard to see that that money is, is um, that that money is, is found, is given to the board to be used for these necessary expenditures. It's not that easy to raise $800,000. Okay, uh, who has the paperwork? Any of you guys have paperwork? It's not clear what paperwork we even submitted for well, the grant and what it is that Diane okay. wants to see. I would like to see the proposal for the grant that was submitted by CTCL. I mean, in order for us to receive these monies, there had to have been an offer or a solicitation for applications. We must have applied. There must have been. No stress. Was that? Uh, may I just say I, that uh, we we will try to 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 go back and and find the paperwork that uh, was submitted in order to obtain funds if that paperwork is still with us. So. Right. This again, this is not a, a concern about our end. I would just like to see what sort of solicitation had gone out to um, local boards around, you know, in our area. Thanks. Thanks, Boris. I can even come in and, and look at it. Uh, Alex. Yeah, uh, I have a question. This eight hundred thousand was this for twenty twenty or twenty twenty two? It's twenty twenty. When was it? So it was twenty. It was it was twenty twenty. We received or applied for any grant funds from CTCL for twenty twenty two. Yeah, they didn't have that. This is twenty twenty. It was the presidential. Yeah. Okay, so it was, it was for the presidential. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I you know I share Diane's concerns. Uh, I would like to see the solicitation information. Uh, we know that CTCL got very involved in certain other counties and other states, especially Wisconsin. Um, I have concerns about allowing any private organization to be funding election administration. I think it's fraught with um, possibilities for uh, manipulation, and there's a lot of uh, danger and unforeseen consequences that can happen when, uh, when this is done. So. Uh, if, if, if apparently we didn't we didn't apply for this or we didn't need it or it didn't it didn't happen in 2022. This was four years ago. Um, but I think when you start opening the door to allow private financing of election operations, it's uh, fraud mm -hmm. with error. And I will just add that um, I know that there are some states like Nevada right yeah, now. Oh, all right, then they're going to look. Can I add to Alec, what Alex said? Go ahead. Okay. 
Uh, it says my connection is stable, so I hope I'm coming through okay. <clears throat> um, you are. I, thank you. I just want to add quickly to Alex's um, comment about the getting uh, funds from third party payers. I, I have a blanket um, disagreement with the opposition to that. I know that underway, particularly in Nevada, funds from a third party group are already moving into the state. Now, again, that's Nevada, but I think we all need to keep our heads up to see what's out on the landscape. And it seems that this sort of, um, this, this may come around again, and I would just like everybody to be aware of it, third party payers, I would continue to oppose. Thanks, that's it. Now, now he, both you and Boris are muted. Imagine. Can you hear me, Kevin? Yes. Oh, okay. I said Boris and Allison, they're going to look at all those paperwork. So present it to us or send it to us by email. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other regarding this subject or something before the board is any report? Kevin, do you sure, have any I guess, report? I, I guess in keeping with our discussion on the center of the track and state of life. Uh, I reported to you all last night that there was a lawsuit followed by three parties. Kevin, I'm sorry, you're I, going in and out. You're not clear communication. It's hard to hear. Yeah, could you just repeat that, please? Can you hear me now? Is it clear? Better. Better. Okay. Yeah. So I, I reported last month that there was a suit filed against the state and all the counties but two and the Center for Tech and Civic Life. And that suit had been dismissed by a federal judge and they have filed a motion to alter, the plaintiffs have filed a motion to alter or amend. Uh, and I will send you a copy of that. But I, I don't suspect it's, <laughs> it's going to go anywhere the, the motion to alter amend is supposedly based upon new evidence of what occurred in the 2022 election, but the court dismissed the case under 12B1 <laughs> for lack of standing. So I don't, I don't think the new evidence is gonna have any impact. Thank you, Kevin. Any other? Any other report you have? No, I, I don't have anything else. Okay, thank you. New business, 2022 election review by staff. Boris. <clears throat> is this the one? Did you send it to me? Okay. Yeah, he was. Okay, go so, ahead. Can everyone hear? Um, yes. Okay. Uh, we, the board asked the staff on in December. Uh, to prepare a presentation for today's meeting. Uh, we tried a uh, uh, presentation, I, I, I will go through it. I hope my colleagues will chime in uh, when where needed. Uh, and I believe that we will order, uh, we, we will answer many questions that uh, could have been raised. And uh, any, any question that you might have in the process, please let us know, we will try either to answer them today or prepare some answer for the follow-up board meeting. Uh, just a so the purpose of the research that we did and that the, today's presentation is in essence to inform board and the general public on any uh, uh, 
preliminary research that we did following 2020 election cycle. We were looking to identify the key trends that would inform our decisions going forward, some areas that we would need to look at and change, and in particular to look at additional data sets that we would need to collect going forward in the future in order to uh, uh, do planning, do implementation, do discussion on election better. Uh, there are a few assumptions that we had uh, going into 2020 election cycle. Uh, we all expect an increased number of mail-in ballots uh, uh, at the expense of uh, in-person voting. Uh, we did expect a reduced number of volunteers that to serve as a poll workers, election judges, and uh, uh, we were aware of a tightening labor market when it comes to hiring temporary staff for the tasks that we uh, uh, had for them in the building. Uh, Redistricting was already delayed as we were going into this process, and the uh, late redistricting led to postponement of the primary postponement of the primary elections. Uh, we had a lower turnout uh, than most of us expected, especially if we compare it to 2018. We will get that. Uh, we, we we had very high increase in uh, web delivery uh, of mailing ballots requests, and especially provisional ballots. The presentation and the data that I'll present uh, shows that uh, we did not have sufficient number of election judges on election day. And uh, uh, we did struggle through the process to hire a uh, sufficient number of temporary team members to help us with all the tasks that were election related in 2022. Uh, what happened is ballots, uh, high number of ballots came in we had a recount between the primary and general. Uh, uh, after primary, we had a petition between primary and general. Uh, we did uh, uh, acquire new equipment, sorting machine to help us with the, with the mail-in ballots. However, it was installed only in May, if I, correct, if I remember correctly. So we really didn't have enough time to fully, uh, to use it to the best possible extent. And in, in order to notify timely all the voters that we have uh, that their ballots have been returned to us. This, uh, uh, this led to delayed notifications to all the voters who were voting by, by mail. Uh, key observations for the, for the presentation itself and going forward is that uh, Montgomery County voters embraced mail-in voting uh, as an option. Uh, we will talk about uh, today and through the presentation and different conversations that uh, space is in demand when it comes to this building for the, all the tasks that we have to do, but when it comes to canvassing off-site and uh, when it comes to polling places where we would like to see more equipment, especially BNDs or similar. Uh, there's a, a certain generational shift going on in, a, in an election workforce, both in the county, across the state, across the nation. Our voters prefer like all the online options, whether it's requesting uh, vote by mail online or requesting web delivery. Uh, change is inevitable for the team, for, the, for uh, some processes, internal ones that, that, we, that we do or that we have, uh, that we'll have to do in 2024. I'll start with the candidate filing, uh, ballot proofing and ballot order, just a very brief overview. Candidate filing was supposed to run for a year, 12 months from February 21 to February 22. It was extended, I believe, twice based on the court order uh, until April 15. Total of 206 candidates filed. Uh, the staff had to do the ballot proofing of 258 precinct level ballot styles. We did proofing of both English and the Spanish version of the ballots, both uh, print and audio versions. Ballot order. We had uh, uh, over 1 million uh, paper ballot ordered, ordered with a three card ballot that goes to 3.21 million pieces of paper. This order was delivered to the BOE on 64 pallets, basically just adding to the squeeze in space that we are already experiencing. I will just go through some of these slides when they refer to turnout. On this slide, I try to compare 2018 to 2022 look, gubernatorial elections, primary versus general. I put in red 
mail-in ballot increase because that's something that, uh, uh, sorry, I just, yeah. mail-in ballot increase across the, across the elections. As you all also can see that the, the turnout went down uh, like almost 12%. 12 when it comes to method of voting, this slide compares primary to the general. Uh, uh, Mail-in ballot was constituted 42% of uh, uh, votes in, for the primary. That uh, percentage went down as the uh, as the overall turnout uh, went up. Uh, this slide compares us to the other counties, bigger counties in state of Maryland. If you look just at the, at the election turnout, uh, it's kind of steady between the biggest counties in, in the state. Uh, what changes is the mail-in ballot requests. Montgomery County has the highest number of mail-in ballots requested. I would just, uh, just a note for everyone who is following the, the presentation. I tried to put a, a, couple, a couple of slides, uh, graphs next to each other, even though they might look alike. I would just advise everyone to look at the left side of the uh, vertical axis, numbers are different. So for example, on the, on the left side graph says primary, the, the top number is 80,000. On the right side is general top number is 140,000. So the shape of the graph might look alike, but doesn't present the same, same number. When it comes to voter registration, I just wanted to pull some numbers and show some comparisons to the board, how our work changed since 2018. Uh, the board knows that we receive voter registration uh, requests all the time. Some of them are brand new where we have to capture every single piece of data. Some of them are exact duplicates. There is nothing to capture. Some require us to change one, uh, one line, whether it's name, address, uh, driving license number, uh, and some request multiple changes. Uh, I didn't pull the number of those requests that came in. I just looked at the number of changes that staff had to identify, verify, take a look, and pay attention while they're processing. This number adds to almost quarter million of items that were changed in 2020, 2022. That number is up some uh, 50, 60,000 compared to 2018. And you will see on the next slide, Eric records that we received that through cross-state cooperation is also up some 55,000 in, in the same uh, time span. Mail-in voting is the, I would say that takes the biggest part of this presentation. Uh, I, I need to, as we go through the presentation, I'll just emphasize uh, some items, more, some less, but the numbers will be for everyone to see on the presentation. Uh, when, it, when it comes, everyone goes to the state website and looks at the numbers of applications that were received by each county and process. For the primary, everyone will, could see that we process 115,000 plus uh, applications. We ran our internal uh, uh, count and our count stopped at 126,000. Uh, what you can see on the state website is number of applications that, that led to the ballot issue. What we, these differences, is duplicate application that's received by the staff and processed and changes that were submitted by the voters. We are talking about voters who submitted more than one application because they moved in the process, they decided to change the party, they changed their contact methods, their names or similar. On anecdotal level, I think Michelle can confirm we had a, someone who submitted 13 applications in, in, in the span this election cycle, we process each application, whether it's brand new or a duplicate in the same day. We have to verify every piece of information that's provided us. The same continue to the general. For the general, the number of applications that led to the ballots is 142,472. Total count that we processed, which includes changes in duplicates, is a bit over 160,000. So, our work goes beyond the official number that you will just see on the website. Uh, next slide shows us something that I mentioned earlier that uh, our voters prefer online solutions. If you look at how uh, uh, ballots were requested, 
for the primary, mail is slightly over internet, online requests, but this is very much related to the fact that State Board of Elections mail an application to every registered voter for the primary. As we move toward general, online number of online requests or percentage as a proportion took over the mail requests. Uh, I pulled the, the, the party breakdown for the primary and the general. Uh, uh, other and Republican percentages stayed the same, even the, though the volume changes. There's only changes between uh, distribution of uh, Democrats and unaffiliated between the primary and general. Hmm. Permanent vote by mail, it's something that was added uh, uh, to the election uh, options. Uh, very well embraced by Montgomery County voters, very steady number, I would say. 61% uh, of all voters who requested vote by mail in primary re requested to be on the permanent list. That number held to 60% as we entered the general election. How, how the staff received those requests, how voters were returning them to us is presented on the following graph. You will see that on the beginning of February, the state mailed those applications out. And uh, by the third week of February, we started uh, to see a big uh, uh, volume, incoming volume for us to process. Uh, kind of plateaued until uh, mid June and definitely plateaued between the primary and general. The slide, which says weekly return mailing ballot requests is on the left side. What you'll see for the primary is a bit of a, a management challenge for the for, for the uh, for the for the staff. Uh, when we received 20, 25,000 applications in span of, of two or three days, <coughs> always the question was: uh, uh, We knew that the incoming volume will plateau. So the question was: To which extent we staff to the uh, to the uh, temporary increase or to the work that was coming uh, uh, the delays ahead of us. So our option was to try to address the, the the backlog, the volume with the staff that we had, while we tried to do some hiring in, in the process, but we were not that successful. Uh, ballot issue method comparisons between the primary and the general. Uh, Web delivery uh, constituted 16% in the primary, went up to 18% in, in, in general election. Uh, when it comes to web delivery, I just wanted to uh, compare us to the other counties uh, on the on the wow. relative terms. When you look just percentages, we are on 18% of uh, web deliveries, just like uh, Howard County, very close to Anne Arundel. Absolute numbers. Uh, the issue here, the one that make a difference. If you look at the absolute number of web deliveries requests that were received by Montgomery County, they're almost equivalent to Prince George's, Baltimore City, and Howard combined. At the very beginning, I said that Montgomery County uh, voters prefer online solutions. Uh, I believe that these three counties combined have almost a half a million more voters than Montgomery County itself. And yet, Number of web deliveries in Montgomery County is on on the uh, on equal on equal scale. Uh, we try to present of uh, to present vote by mail applications uh, per age group, and uh, you will see that uh, if you look uh, 55 and over, we are talking about 60 percent of those applications came from these demographic group. Uh, the next graph just shows uh, uh, both mail requests and web requests for the same age groups and their distribution of total. And uh, okay, when it comes to the permanent requests, uh, the, the percentages hold to a great extent, with web still staying on 16%, mail going up to 83%. Uh, permanent request per party breakdown. I would also argue that the percentage is full, that there is no any major discrepancies for the any data that was presented previously. Permanent request per age group. 
we, we see here like four to five percentages increase for the population of 55 plus compared to the other uh, demographics. And the next slide shows total of permanent versus to, uh, web deliveries. If you look from the left to the right, age groups, you will see that uh, percentage of permanent requests among the age groups rises if you look from the left to the right. Quite opposite, the uh, proportion of web deliveries goes down as we move from uh, 18 to 24 age group to 65 plus age group. <laughs> I think it was fair to present the data as we have. Uh, options to return voter mail in ballots. Uh, all the voters could return it via a USPS mail, utilize any of 55 official drop boxes through the county, in person here at the Board of Elections, nursing home program, or any early voting center or polling place. Uh, when we look total number, total percentage of requested uh, vote by mail ballots versus those that were returned, uh, there were a bit under two thirds returned for the primary, and we went over 83% of return for the general. I think that we are almost as a whole state. How those uh, vote by mail ballots were returned, 53% through the draw boxes, 43% through the uh, mail, Voting centers constituted 2%, the rest is nursing homes and in person. I would like uh, Aaron to take a look and uh, notice the difference between next two slides. The first one presents draw boxes collection volume for the primary. And you will wow. see that's very flat line with <laughs> wow. a high spike on the election day leading us to receive almost 12,000 vote by mail ballots through the drop boxes on election day for the primary. The next slide is for the general election. Absolutely identical. <laughs> the difference between the ballots received on election day between primary and general is around 200. This is a trend that tells us a lot about our voters and this is something that we have to plan for and prepare for. Can we tell if it's the same 12,000 people? <laughs> <laughs> Possible? All the procrastinators. Uh, we wanted to present to the board the draw boxes with the highest collected volumes of mailing ballots, both for the primary and general. And you will see that they represent that the vote list on the left and the right includes. Uh, uh, it's quite repetitive, let's put it this way. The next uh, slide is lowest collected volume of mail-in ballots in the board primary and general. And again, there are repetitive locations on the board left and right side for the primary and for the general. And, and this are, these are total numbers, right? For these the whole numbers. period where the Dropbox was available. Right. Okay. Next two slides uh, represent the, the data that staff recorded of incoming mail, uh, by mail return, vote by mail ballots. Uh, they have a both primary and general, they have their own spikes, they have lower uh, uh, return rate. As the kind of a general rule is that uh, voters who return ballots by mail tend to send majority before the election day, but the, those few drop boxes, I obviously, wait for the last last week. Once those ballots were received in the building, we process them, we prepare them for the canvas, which is next segment of this presentation. Uh, we use multiple lo uh, locations in 2022 uh, general elections. Uh, those decisions were driven by the total volume that we, of ballots that we had to canvas and the availability of off-site locations. Locations where we canvas was Board of Elections building for four days, Montgomery County Fairgrounds for three days, and Montgomery, Montgomery College Germantown campus for 11 days in total. When it comes to the volume that was canvassed in each of these locations, you will see that Montgomery County College campus took 70% of the overall volume that was canvassed for this 
election, for the uh, general election. The next slide compares a uh, number of volume of canvas vote by mail ballots per day with, uh, with the total number of canvassers that were available in helping us on that particular day. Sure, sure. Uh, there, are, if you would try to find uh, exact correlation between the number and canvassers, uh, it will not fit the pattern in these two slides. Uh, if you look uh, day 16, for example, you will see that volume went down because of the number of web deliveries that we had to process that day. The same goes for the, if you compare day one and day two. So every time we had to do web deliveries, regardless of the, of the number of teams we had, the volume went down tremendously. Uh, provisional ballots, uh, all the provisional ballots that were collected at the polling places, the early voting centers where applications were researched by the voter registration team here at the BOE building. Uh, as board members know, there are 12 available reasons why the election judges issue or notify that reasons uh, on the application. I looked at the, uh, at the main one when it comes to the numbers of uh, uh, provisional that came in. Those relate to those voters who show up to vote and not their precinct, their polling place, uh, change of address, change of party affiliation, listed as absentee or already voted, and they're not pre qualified for same day registration. The next slide just compares the numbers. Code one and code four were the key ones that's, that were in the focus. Uh, I have to be uh, very honest with the board. As I said, uh, it, it was a busy season researching these numbers, pulling the data takes time. Uh, we try to do our best with the, with the research on code four, and that's what I will present, present today. Uh, when it comes to code four, people who requested vote by mail, but showed up in person and voted provisional, 56% of them uh, requested vote by mail, by mail, 44% by ballot. Uh, party breakdown, there's no major discrepancies here. The percentages hold as for the overall uh, number of uh, requests of vote by mail. Age group just follows the same pattern that we have seen previously. The, the highest number, again, is 65 plus age group. Uh, <clears throat> web delivery and mail delivery, the pattern holds. So there's no big surprises there either. So uh, if we look at the, uh, at the demographics where we sh should use this data, try to find better ways to communicate with them. It's, uh, I would say everyone, but majority is, uh, 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 I would say 45 plus. So I'm included in that group as well. Uh, election judges, and recruitment is this next segment. Uh, I would like to point out that we received a bit over 6,500 applications from us voters who expressed interest to be poll workers in this election cycle. And uh, they were supposed to take online quiz, take online training module and hands-on training. Uh, out of 6,500, uh, only a bit less than 3,700 completed the quiz. Uh, 3,533 3, applicants passed the quiz and 144 applicants failed the quiz, <coughs> online quiz. Uh, the next slide provides cross-election comparison compared 2018 to 2022. I'm sorry, I just tried to move stuff I can see. Uh, if you look at the capacity for training that was provided in 2018, uh, you can see that we increased it by 20, uh, 20, uh, 2,400 slots. However, our number of trainees that went through the training went down by 1,200. If you compare it solely primary to primary. If you look general to general, 2018 to 2020, 
Uh, I think that we managed our capacity better, but again, the total number of uh, uh, applicants who went through the training went down for 1100 compared to 2018. Uh, we had multiple locations for 2020 primary. Uh, you will see that we had 565 classes for 3,020 election judges. We were running uh, classes with a very small number of participants because we wanted to literally bring whoever was interested to help us in the primary election. When it comes to the general, number of classes went down, but the total number also went up slightly. The next slide just tells us the story of what, where we need to look going forward, going to 2024. Uh, we have to address the fact that 2,800 uh, uh, applicants who complete the application online never took the quiz. Why? How do we reach them? How do we bring them on board? Uh, we had 350 uh, uh, potential election workers uh, who completed the quiz online but never took the training. Uh, 528 completed training but never served. Uh, so our targets that we had in terms of preparing for the election cycle were missed by 707 trainees or beat over 1,200 election judges on election day for the general election. Is what your target was the allocation? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. When it comes to overall election workers, election judges, there's a breakdown per, pol per political party. Uh, uh, I should have maybe added percentages here, but numbers, I think, fall to the overall uh, uh, distribution of party affiliation. When it comes to the age group of the election judges, you will see the... 61, 70 was the highest one. Yes, the, the, the highest group in terms of participation as election workers is age group 61 to 70. If you look 51 plus, that's our majority, absolute majority of the election uh, work, work, election workforce. But you've also split up the category of the up to 20s into individual spots. That's correct. We, we split you, them up because of the future what we'll get there. That's right, perfect. but I mean, but if you added them all together, um, it looks like the the under twenties are over ten percent, right? It's like uh, they'll be around twelve percent, right? Just below the 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 fifty to eighty range, and and more than the forty one to fifty range. That's correct. Now, if you look 16, 17, 18, 19, if you add them together, that, that was the that was the, the comment. So you are looking about 11.5% of the of the of the workforce. Uh, the next section, I, I just uh, apologize, it's it, it's a uh, it's a lot. So I'm just trying to go through the presentation, hoping to cover everything. Is a uh, 2022 general election wait times. We looked at the early voting and election day. Uh, when we look at the reported wait times for the early voting, we only noticed some on the day eight, the last day, and they are presented on this slide with the indicated in red. Uh, on the Can you go back for a second, please, to that slide? That's number of minutes. Yes, that's good. So the so the largest um, the the largest wait time was thirty minutes in the what looks to be the last hour at Boar Park. Yeah. That's what was reported to us. That's correct. Right. That's and it looks, it looks like they had more wait in the course of the afternoon than the others did, but most of the places there was almost no wait. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next slide presents number of precincts that report a wait time per hour. As expected at seven o'clock, we had, uh, I believe, 42 precincts that reported some wait time and a certain uh, spike at 10 o'clock, then again back five o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, 
number of precincts with wait time over 10 minutes. Again, there were 12 of them at seven o'clock when they opened. And that number went down to the four of them at five o'clock and uh, I think three at seven o'clock. We tried to look at the longest reported wait times per each hour and extract which precinct was it. So on the next slide, you will see that at 7 a.m. it was 09.40. Uh, at 7 p.m. it was 13.05. <clears throat> Can you tell us um, what precincts are 7.13, 13.05 and 10.13? So 7.13 is Westland Middle School. Bethesda. Okay. Uh, 1013 is Potomac Rec Center and 1305 is Silver uh, Silver Springs okay. Civic Center. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. You know, there's provisionals coming in there. Well, for Silver Spring, but not for yeah. the other. Right. Well, so and, well, and put Potomac too. Yeah. I don't know what's happening at Westland Middle School. Uh, they had, a, I would say, very light staffing, if I can say that. Yes, I was at Silver Spring and went to nine o'clock. Okay. Uh, Boris, the light staffing was for Westland Middle School, is that what you're saying? That's correct. Do you know how many people they had? They had uh, six uh, VOPs altogether. Oh, wow. Wow. Not two chiefs, but six VOPs. So uh, that light staffing is an uh, explanation for this wait time. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Uh, the next section uh, is equipment, BMDs, scanners, and electronic poll books. Uh, when it comes to IT section, we talk about logic and accuracy. And integrity reports. We are talking about issues that were reported in regards to the security seals that uh, uh, I would call it like a recording error was made to them. Uh, when it comes to the BM BMDs, we have 99.09 .09 accuracy, poll books is 97.79, and scanner is 99.2% report. Uh, this slide presents call center for early voting and election day support for the election judges and the early voting center managers and the issues that were raised in those, in those phone calls. Election night reporting, uh, early voting results and the mail-in ballot results tabulated by the election day were posted by, on the state website by eight o'clock. Uh, by 11 p.m. on election day, we had 96.5 percent of the election day results were already received and uploaded. That, that's equivalent to 223 out of 231 precincts. The remaining precincts all reported by 12.30 a.m. Can you give us, I'm sorry, Boris, could you give us a sense of where the regional sites were located? Uh, Janet, do you? Um, where the regional sites? <laughs> yeah, it appears that there are um, six regional sites. That's correct. Yes. Can you hear? Can you hear Janet? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Potomac, yes. Go Island, ahead. Bethesda Library, Mid County Rec Center, Praisner Rec Center, White Oak, and here. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the, we tried to present it on a graph, how it looks like incoming materials against the, 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 the time frame. Uh, is the bird on? Yeah. Can't tell. Okay. Yeah. Alberto, if you're on, can you raise your hand so that you can address the next section here? There he is. Okay, we will have Dr. Zlai to address the outreach. Jerry will need to unmute him. Do you see it? Mm -hmm. He's right here. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Does he say? 
Okay. We're, we're waiting. Yes. We're waiting for Jerry to unmute. Um, oh, here's. Diane has a question. You, I know, but unmute you. Okay. Jerry, can you unmute Diane as well? Is Janet, is Jerry maybe not in his office? He's not unmuting either one of them. It's this film they have to respond to. I think they could see the pop up on the screen. Okay, I got it. Um, since we're moving to somebody else, I had a question for Boris. It was at the beginning of the presentation and I didn't want to interrupt, but it goes back. Just a quick question, if this is the appropriate time. You had mentioned <clears throat> um, under some of the data, the number of ERIC records per year, ERIC. Um, what comprises the ERIC records? Uh, or I if- that, that, That's okay. I, I think that, uh, so we are looking at the cross state, uh, across the state between the states data exchange. We are talking about a, a national change of address data for social security, uh, that records, any records that are received by uh, uh, other state for our current voters. So I can put the whole list that was used as a part of the, I think March, 2021 presentation. Yeah, that would, that, would be, that would be great. Thank you. Not a problem at all. Okay. Boris is here. I mean, <laughs> Alberto is here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Look at that screen. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Uh, Happy New Year. First and foremost, I want to thank all of our community partners and advocates, our voters, poll workers, and future vote families for making outreach uh, another successful year. Um, I will go through the presentation. So outreach and engagement, the focus has never changed. Uh, we're always looking at recruitment, both bilingual, <laughs> tech savvy, young adults and students. We have an incredible relationship with Montgomery College and MCPS. So I thank them for that. Um, also voters with disabilities, looking at to uh, expand our senior uh, electorate uh, that is always growing. It's one of the fastest growing population in Montgomery County and across the nation. Our newly naturalized citizens, uh, individually, individual voters who are linguistically concentrated within their communities around Montgomery County, and obviously student engagement with our Future Vote Initiative, um, which has never wavered since 2004. Okay. Um, so the topics have always been focused on engagement and teaching our electorate about voting in Maryland. Um, and so that also in includes the mail-in procedures, provisional voting, sample ballot usage, the difference between leveraging a ballot drop box and or USPS and those specific deadlines. For example, the post office on, uh, on election day usually closes at five. So we highly recommend individuals leveraging the drop boxes because they are available until 8 p.m. Um, and also promoting individuals um, or procrastinators, of course, not to hold on to those ballot drop boxes, but we do understand that life is life and we're here to serve. The difference between voter registration and voter maintenance, which is very important, it's a, it's a, it's a two-way street. Uh, the difference between leveraging early voting and election day voting, looking at the voter assistance forms and the different needs that voters uh, have, whether it's ADA, language needs, et cetera, the demonstrations of the voting equipment, the recruitment of bilingual poll workers, whether you're bilingual or monolingual, we, we need them all. Um, but of course, as you know, Montgomery County has four of the most diverse cities in the nation. So we look at the population and also the needs, the linguistic needs in each of our polling places. And of course, election judge and future vote recruitment. Um, if you look at the outreach, I will apologize. One thing I noticed from what was presented to the board, the numbers that didn't add up to my smart sheet was Silver Spring. There was 42 outreach events that we had around the Silver Spring area. I believe what was sent had about 217 and it was missing the Silver Spring. So I caught that earlier today, so I apologize. So we try to go out into the community. Obviously there's the pre and post COVID, um, you know, we're growing and the county is opening. There's more community events 
in which we're doing outreach to engage the our voter population. So that will continue to increase. And we're, we have actually several events uh, lined up this coming February. Future Vote Ambassadors, a little, uh, a little bit over 1,100 participants. This is kind of the breakdown. As you notice, there's a little dip from 10th to 11th grade. Um, by the time our civic-minded students, uh, they have more than ample uh, amounts of student service learning credits, the infamous SSL hours that they need. And then what we try to do is a lot of them, we will encourage them to become poll workers. Um, just as um, uh, Mr. Naiman noted, about 11% of our poll workers are high school students. And one of our big uh, recruitment tools is promoting of our future vote ambassadors once they meet the state requirements to number one, register to vote, um, have citizenship and live in Maryland for them to serve as poll workers. And by the time they're in uh, 11, 12th grade, my son included, uh, they prefer the stipend. This is the breakdown of our future vote ambassadors. This is the demographics. Uh, as you can see, we try to get a nice uh, rep representation of our county. Uh, one interesting fact um, is also many of these students, a little over a third, have bilingual competency, which really helps us service our voters as they vote during early voting or on election day. Um, and if you look at the uh, split between uh, male and females, pretty much even, um, and is very reflective of the community that we serve. Now we're going to uh, Facebook. We do have a nice presence and seen growth uh, through our social media platforms. If you look at the breakdown on Facebook, about 65% are uh, females, women, and 34% male. You see the demographics um, in uh, the usage of, uh, of Facebook. And if you look at the post uh, impressions, when we post something, we have a little bit over 97,000 uh, impressions of individuals that seen our, post, our posting or engaged with them. And then if you look at post impressions, that means when I post something on uh, voter maintenance, early voting, poll worker recruitments, um, when they click on a particular hyperlink on that posting, about a little over 15,000 uh, individuals from that 97,000 uh, will engage with that post. The Google ads, very popular still, uh, over 905,000 impressions, about 16,000 uh, interactions. Of course, if they do a Google search for Dropbox, that, that ad will have additional information, for example, for the closest Dropbox, uh, text box plus your zip code. And if they click on that or for more information leading to our homepage, that's a little over 16,000. Um, and so the share is about 33%. So it's, it's very uh, uh, efficient. And the campaign analytics, uh, our MoCo Votes app is more popular. So we had about 67,000 downloads on our app. And the app um, has a lot of great information. It's kind of a diluted version of our website. It's easy, it's, on your, it's in your hands, it's also bilingual. Uh, as pertains to SMS short codes, whether you're texting vote to register to vote, whether you're texting change to update or review your voter registration, et cetera. We had about four, over 40,000 engagements. So it's getting also more popular uh, with those automated services that we provide to our voters. Radio impression, uh, over a, a million, and then print impressions, over 820,000. And that's my portion. So thank, thank you so you. much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much. Any question for Gilberto? Uh, Alan. Yeah, I have. Can you drill down more, Dr. Z, into the content of the ads that you were putting out there on? I mean, I, I, I follow you on, on uh, Facebook. I know what you do there. But what, what do you do for, for uh, radio, print, and so mm -hmm. on? Yeah. Give so idea you're, what, what you're advertising. Yeah. So you're one of our star followers. So thank you. Um, <laughs> So you get a golden star, uh, but most definitely when we do any type of ads, do. They're, they're focused on the topic or the subject as we near early voting on election day and or as we near deliverables. For example, the voter registration deadline, the mail-in ballot request deadline. Um, so those are all centered according to the calendar. So as we near, um, and also not only the online uh, social media posting, 
but also our um, media as it pertains to buying uh, ad space on our uh, ethnically diverse uh, uh, vendors. So what we do is if there's a voter registration deadline coming up, then we would encourage individuals to identify the actual deadline, um, the options to register to vote, whether it's texting the word vote to 77788 or the word vota in Spanish. Um, we have those in different languages. It also coincides with our media presence on Twitter uh, and also Facebook. And so we have kind of a branding one look. So when something is circulating, and in addition, for example, you've heard us on WTOP, that all coincides as well. And if it's in Spanish, it'll be uh, Mega or Radio, La Mega or Radio um, America. So anytime any type of campaign is packaged, it has the multi prong uh, effect where it's both web, media, radio, uh, and, and also the outreach we conduct. So it's all focused at one time. So when we push the message out, as you see the posting that you, you respond to, it also coincides with ad space and also Google search. So if I search uh, at that time, you know, Dropbox, it will give you the corresponding SMS code and or hyperlinks that will link, link them directly to our homepage. So it's all, they all coincide. One more question. Um, Boris's PowerPoint identifies that the highest, that the, the age group with the highest percentage of provisionals is 65 plus, followed by 55 to 64. And you you were saying this is the, the fastest growing demographic of words that affect. Uh, can, can I assume that, that you're putting more money into various kinds of senior outlets to tell seniors how to vote? We will love to. Um, one of the things I know we've requested from the council is more funding for our media presence. We have about 70,000. Um, we do have ad space on the senior beacon, which is very popular. One of the, the concerns is to add another avenue means we have to dilute uh, the other vendors if we don't get any more funding. So we're limited with the 70,000. I would love to buy more ad space and other uh, publications uh, or even radio stations that has that target senior that 55 or 60 65 up um, the issue is in order for me to make stretch that 70,000 I'm very limited without diluting all the other uh, multicultural vendors that we work with so the trick is hopefully um, increase that budget so then I could get more creative thank you uh, thank Alan any other question David. Uh, thank you, uh, Nahid. Um, Alberto, can we go back to the slide about the Facebook users, if you don't mind? I want to go back to the there was a the gender differences. Okay. Um, so um, when you um, if you go online and you talk about Facebook users in general, they are apparently more male than female. Um, and I didn't know if you had any theories as to why it appears, aside, of course, from your, uh, you know, your charm, um, why it is that um, we have, we seem to have substantially more women who are coming to our Facebook page than men. Women are busy. <laughs> I don't, you know, the, these analytics come directly from our handle, so it pulls these numbers from whatever we post. Um, why? I don't know, to be honest. Um, uh, maybe I need to put more, uh, since the Super Bowl is around the corner, some more athletic Super Bowl posting, <laughs> you know, I'll get creative. And if you look at our posting, they're very creative. Alan is, is on, on, you know, part of the team and he sees what we put on. I always try to package what's the hot topic for the kind of the season, whether it's the holidays, vacation, the weather, right. I right. tend to lean on that. So, and, um, I, and I should say, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you have to change because there's nothing wrong with however it comes out. I'm just suggesting that it would be interesting to find out if there is a, 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 a reason for that pattern and then decide if there's anything to be done about it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Any other question for Gilberto? 
Only can see it. I'll go on the other one. <laughs> okay, I will just continue uh, with the last segments of the presentation. Uh, this one refers to the customer services, basically the call center, a number of the phone calls that we received a certain span of time. Uh, we had a traditionally we, we have a, a call center, operational call center that uh, takes incoming uh, voter phone calls for the period of time before the election day. Uh, for the general election, that period was October 13th to November, November 8th. Uh, you will see on this graph the distribution of the all incoming phone calls per day in that, in that period. Of course, the biggest spike is right before the, the election day. Uh, the phone call center operated uh, for the phone calls directed to 8,500 phone number, but in the same time we had 8,550 phone number that was direct line for the uh, mailing bell, uh, mail, mailing ballot section. On this slide, I tried to present them next to each other because they were answered by different people, but they were coming in in the same in the same time. We looked at the duration of these phone calls. Uh, number one, our goal is to reduce the need for so many phone calls because most of them are generated by people asking about their ballots, where they are, how they can change things. But if the phone calls come in, we would like to look at the training of our, our contractors that serve in the call center so we can increase the, the proportion of phone calls that we are take care of within the first three three minutes. Uh, the percentages, when you look at the duration of the phone calls, kind of correlate between both call center, which is 8,500 uh, phone number, and mail-in ballot section, which is 8,550. Under three minutes, we had 35% of phone calls on, on both phone lines. Special initiatives, just very briefly, the board is well aware that Montgomery County ran the pilot project we were the only county in the state of Maryland, and I believe on this coast as well, that uh, introduced this uh, text to cure option for the voters who didn't sign their mailing ballot, giving them an option to sign it on their mobile devices. Uh, we used the, the uh, I believe the solution that is used already in uh, multiple states throughout the nation. And as far as I know, the state is looking to contracting this service for all counties for 2024. But again, it's a state. Uh, Pick a Pal is an initiative where we are trying to promote, uh, uh, to encourage people to bring their friends to serve as election <laughs> judges. Idea is if you sign up, go to a training, you refer a friend. If your friend uh, trains and serves, you go into a raffle to win an award. This, uh, it was introduced in 2020, I believe. This was the first election that we had the chance to implement it properly. For this election cycle, we had 260 participants who brought their friends for, for this for this project. So we will continue for the 2024. Look at the what would be acceptable awards. Let's put it this way for the different different winners. And these yeah. are people who brought their friends to be election judges. Yes. Yeah. So it, it's a. It's a project to keep on and keeping inspiring the friends to serve together. That's it. And uh, as I mentioned throughout the presentation, we had uh, issues where we tried to hire temporary staff and we couldn't for very different reasons, whether it was uh, 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 late in the process or the market was as such that the uh, candidates were looking at the different options. Uh, uh, in that in that time, also came up with ideas of floaters, and Lisa actually implemented it, where we brought in people to serve as many hours they could in the course of the week, and to serve to on any task that there's available in the building. So we had a number of uh, floaters who were with us. Uh, they covered any task that was either with the, primarily water services and IT. Literally one day working on a, on a helping us with the mode by mail ballot and moving to a completely different task they after. The problem only was they would serve like they had a schedule of four hours on Monday, two on Tuesday, no hours on Wednesday, then again six on Thursday. So it was a bit of juggling to, to plan on. 
And that would be all. Okay. Thank you very much, Boris. Thank you. Any question? More question for Boris from the board? Alan, your hand is up. You have a question or no? Yes. Uh, th thank you, Nahi. Yeah. Uh, a question I'd like to ask going back to the Center for Tech and Civic Life grant, the 32000 and change for security cameras. Do we own those cameras? We should, yeah, we do. Okay, so that's, that's a one time payment. That's correct. Great, thanks. Okay, yeah. That's it. Uh, new business. We have so oh, many new business. Oh, you wanted to talk to about that, right? Go ahead, a lot of work. Okay. Very impressive. I, I may have more questions when I have some chance to digest it, but uh, sure. thank you for putting right. it together. This was, uh, yeah, question. David's got a question. Alex, uh, you should talk. Well, we, we, we can talk about that when we get to the list of other. Okay, David. Uh, thank you. I, I just wanted to uh, thank Boris for a very data heavy presentation that would give us a lot to think about, and not just us, obviously. Um, would it be possible for the PowerPoint to be posted on the website so that others can um, look at it as well? Excellent. Um, thank you very much. I, I look forward also, like, uh, like Alex suggested, I, I'd like to have some time to study a little more to uh, um, to, to ask questions, because there were really were so many different um, potential avenues that 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 data leads to follow up questions about, um, but it's very uh, it's very useful for us to have. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Boris. Very good presentation. Uh, we have few new business. David, you're going to talk about that uh, the page about needed expenditure. Sure. sure. Let yeah. me just and pull it up. I send it to whole world. Um, yes, let me just, uh, let me just find it. Okay. Sure. Yes. Um, so this document was an effort to attempt to, um, capture in one place, a number of things that have come up over the course of 2022. Um, and to come up with, um, suggestions for fixing things that were likely to gather consensus, realizing that on many things, there may be differences of opinions among us and obviously um, among uh, legislators or state board members or whoever needs to find us, et cetera. But the goal was to, uh, was to attempt to capture things. These suggestions came from a variety of different people um, and it's the, the effort was to kind of make a, a list of some of the kind of running things that um, that took place over the course of the year. Um, Madam President, did you want me? I don't know whether this document was made available to others other than board members. Yeah, uh, it was sent to everybody. He's one. saying board other than board members. Right. In other words, was it posted? It was sent to board member. Okay. Staff has it. Staff has it as staff well. Has them okay. Right. Board members and staff has it. Okay. So then, then let me um, let me just go go through them very briefly for those who who don't have it. Um, and 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 then uh, and I and like I said, you know, I'm sure there's going to be suggestions from people about things they would want to uh, include, wouldn't want to include, you know, etc. This was just kind of a, a a list of the things that came up over the course of the year. Um, number one is uh, to fix the ballot marking devices with the seven candidate limit on a page. We heard a lot about that in the primary, as you may recall. And we also we wrote to the state about this, um, I believe seven years ago to suggest that they adopt the change for allowing 14 on a page. Um, and also to make sure that if there is more than one page that it lists the office for which a candidate is running. Um, Second thing that we might need is a larger location for ballot canvassing. I realize that the staff may have a different approach mm -hmm. to this, but um, one possibility at least is to, um, you know, in any event, we don't have the space in our in our current 
office space. So we do need to have something budgeted for uh, for our canvas to make sure we have enough canvas teams because of of the significant volume of ballots um, that we uh, that we need to process. Um, and then the third thing was uh, the suggestion of more staff to prepare for those canvases and also to assist in uh, beeping in the ballots as they are returned to the board. Um, I do realize that there also are technological fixes that might um, um, help with that, uh, including uh, changes to how the ballot sorting equipment um, interfaces with MD voters. Um, but uh, clearly we have an issue with how quickly people find out that we have their, uh, their ballot. Um, number four is an effort to address uh, web delivered ballots without changing the rules for who can vote by web delivered ballot, but by requiring that when people request their web delivered ballots, that they affirm that they are uh, knowledgeable of each of the steps that are involved, um, which hopefully will get at a number of the people who probably have picked it without realizing what they're getting. Um, so the idea would be that the system would not let you move on uh, until you confirm that you understand that you need to, um, you know, have your own printer, your own paper, your own envelope, et cetera. Uh, and then and then they hand duplication when it um, when it comes to us. Um, number five was uh, the idea of an email reminder to all the voters on the permanent mail in ballot list for web delivered ballots. Um, and um, I think Boris can tell us about the number, but there's a very high number of permanent web delivered ballot uh, voters. And the idea would be, again, to reiterate that they understand all the steps that are involved and find out if that is, in fact, what they um, what they would like to do. We're already required by law to send a or some or someone is required to send the voters. A, a reminder that they're on the permanent mail in ballot list, so it could be done in conjunction with that or separately. Uh, the number that I have there, I believe came from uh, from Boris, but he can confirm 13,700 voters on the permanent web, deli web delivered mail-in ballot list. Um, number six was uh, an effort to deal with the flip side of the web delivered issue, which is the US mail delivered issue. Um, there were a lot of voters who didn't get their US mail delivered ballots for more than two weeks. Um, this was designed to uh, require that they be put into the mail within two business days. I understand that that, in fact, is possible, that it's already taking place in some ways. We don't really know why it takes as long as it does for some of those ballots to arrive. But the idea would be is to um, propose to do whatever we can to make those ballots arrive sooner, which also would be a way of encouraging people to, not to rely on web delivered ballots, but to rely on US mail delivered ballots if they were arrive faster. Number seven uh, is to change the certification deadline in, uh, in the law, which um, Montgomery County has never and can never uh, finish within 10 days after the election. Um, you all saw the chart as to how many people vote at the last minute. Um, it, it is, um, you know, that doesn't even consider the ballots that come that come in after the last minute, um, because they are still allowed to arrive, you know, for 10 days after the election. The hope would be is to have a more realistic uh, deadline that um, um, you know, of uh, the, the suggestion was 21 days after uh, after Election Day. Uh, number eight, uh, I wanted to say is just an idea of another possible way to deal with the issue we've had with the number of provisional ballots on election day at at polling places that um, were early voting centers. And uh, Barbara Sanders sent us, I just glanced at it because uh, it was sent to us during this meeting, but she sent us a, a, a letter a long time ago predicting some of the issues that we had in this last election and with a number of suggestions for how we uh, can perhaps educate people about uh, the difference between election day voting and early voting, this would be going in a slightly different direction. This would be 
open the early voting centers as early voting centers. In other words, allow the voters to do what a lot of them are already trying to do, which is to go to those locations, even if they live out of precinct, and then continue to operate election day voting and other precincts in the same way that we have. It would be kind of a hybrid uh, system on election day. But if we were to do that, and if we were to use the ballot marking devices, which can automatically produce all of the ballot styles, um, we might be able to significantly lower the lines at those locations and lower the number of provisional ballots at those locations. I'm sure there'll be other technical issues that the staff can um, point out for us. Um, number nine is to um, make it a crime to threaten or assault an election worker. Uh, there's a Colorado law that I sent the board as an example. Um, we obviously would want that to be in effect at both uh, voting locations and at Canvas. Um, number 10 was uh, there's a, a, a Comar provision that requires that the recount occur within two business days of the request. That's not a reasonable amount of time. Uh, our, our staff was basically working around the clock um, when, when we had the recount last summer, and I think we still had I think it was requested on a Monday and we started on a Friday. Um, so, um, and that was, you know, um, we, we, we shouldn't be uh, asking our staff to work around the clock. It's not good for them or for us. Um, so um, the idea would be to make it five business days instead of two. Um, number 11 is the idea of taking voters off of the permanent mail-in ballot list if they vote provisionally twice in a row. In other words, if they decide not to vote by mail after you know, the permanent list twice in a row, perhaps they don't really want to be on that list, they could always get back on it. Um, number 12, um, you guys may remember that we had some voters uh, during the canvas who were 18-year-olds living with their parents without driver's licenses, and they didn't really have a way to prove their residence because they don't have a, a lease, they don't have um uh, a utility bill because it's in their parents name this would be uh, another way of allowing them to certify that that is where they live in case that's needed for their voter registration um would they, would they bring the affidavit in um would it be um notarized um i didn't get that far as to okay. notarization <laughs> um I personally would not require notarization because I don't think we require notarization for anything else. Um, um, and there's no reason to believe that this particular group would be in a worse position than others, but that would be a detail to be worked out. Th these are not designed to be uh, complete pieces of legislation. These are designed to be kind of thoughts to get conversation started about issues that we addressed. So if notarization were to be important, if there, you know, because there's no other, you know, kind of uh, confirmation, um, you know, I would consider that. Um, but I'd want to know what the, you know, what the ramifications of that are from my perspective. Obviously, I'm one board member. So, you know, uh, it's free. Have a, a different. I, Otherwise, I, you have a poll tax. Well, yeah, I didn't. I didn't. I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't mean to drag us down into the weeds on this. I <clears throat> it was popped off the top of my head. That's good. We'll discuss okay. it. Definitely. Right. Right. Um, number thirteen would be to allow voters who vote the wrong party ballot in the primary to have their ballots accepted in part, so that their votes for the nonpartisan school board races would be counted, as it currently stands. If I'm a Democratic voter who requests a Republican ballot and I get a Republican provisional ballot and you look at the voter rolls and I'm listed as a Democrat, not only can I not vote the Republican primary ballot, but my vote for school board is thrown out as well. But we know that independents, Republicans and Democrats are eligible to vote in the school board primary regardless of their party affiliation. The thought would be that those votes should be counted um, the fact that you are voting the wrong party might affect which party offices you vote for, but not the nonpartisan offices that you vote for. Um, I'm in the home stretch here, and I apologize for the, the length of this, but uh, I want to make sure that the public has a chance to hear it. Number 14 is to eliminate the statute that rejects ballots for having identifying marks. Um, we're, as you guys know, we are currently required to reject any ballot where the voter signs their name. Um, and sometimes we get 
such ballots from voters who are explaining the errors they made on their ballot or initialing changes that they made, et cetera. Uh, so that so that was the thought um, behind that. Um, number 15 would be to essentially codify the process that we used in 2022 that the state board mandated of allowing voters to deliver mail-in ballots to the polls. It would be to put into law uh, authority for that, um, for that activity. Um, number 16, um, and this one may be beyond the purview of the Board of Elections, but it would be to allow unaffiliated voters to vote for judges in the primary in the judges elections. As it stands now, there is a Republican primary, there is a Democratic primary. All the judges run in both of those primaries, but the independent voters do not get the opportunity to vote for, uh, for the, the judges in the, uh, in the judges primary. And number 17, um, and it's only at number 17 because I'm not sure if it should be legislation, but uh, it is a, a change to the ballot instructions to make sure that we say, please use black or blue ink. As you guys know, an enormous amount of effort went into darkening uh, penciled ballots. Um, and uh, I'm not advocating that they not be that those ballots not be counted. I am advocating that we encourage our voters to use ink and lessen the workload of our canvassers. Um, my thought was just to try to see which of these items are easy for us to agree on. Uh, if, if anything is in the category of horribly controversial, we don't have to do it. Um, and, and then we would just talk to whoever is responsible. In some cases, if it's funding, it's, it's county officials. If it's state legislation, it's state officials to see if some of these odds and ends can be taken care of, because I think we have a lot of this in the course of our work. And thank you, Madam President, for letting me do that. Yeah, I'm sure me and Alan will be happy about their pencil and ink. Mm -hmm. so we, we yes, well, when I said that they came from various members of the board, uh, certainly I heard that one from Alan on multiple occasions. Yeah, so you didn't hear mine, it's good. Uh, Alan, your hand is up. Do you have a question? Yeah, uh, these, these are all very good proposals. One, one suggestion is move number 17 about black and blue egg up to number one. Uh, number one goes to the state board. Uh, how about if we have oh, that's... A, a letter to the state board that has not only uh, what, why don't you fix the seven candidate limit and also please be sure to, to tell voters every which way use black or blue ink, not pencil. Yeah, because they have to change the software. That that sounds like a, a a good idea to me. Yes, yes. Great. Uh, any other observation or thought regarding this? What David, it was sent to you guys. I'm sure you all got it. You yeah, Bor Boris sent it around. Um, right. Yeah. To, just so the board the board knows, Boris is uh, exploring a long term lease with Montgomery College for the canvas. Mm. Montgomery College, uh, thank you. Mm. If you need negotiation, mm. I do. So. <laughs> Alex, um, thank you, Madam President. Yeah, I, I wanted to thank uh, Mr. Naiman for putting together this list. There's some very interesting ideas here. Um, you know. One thing I think we, we I would want to add to the needed expenditures, I think we should really fundamentally rethink what we're doing with the security cameras for the drop boxes. Um, I think the video data needs to be more widely available to people who want to see it, and it shouldn't be so difficult. There shouldn't be so much red tape, and there shouldn't be so much expense in actually trying to get a copy of it so that if people want to look at it, they can look at it. Um, I don't know if that means we should invest in our own security cameras and not rely on the public schools. I think there are problems with that. Relying on the public school security cameras, it might be better to have uh, the board have its own cameras and its own data. Um, but uh, you know, as, as it stands now, I don't think we really know what these things show or don't show because it's so impossible to get data. Um, with the seven candidate limit, I might encourage my friend, Mr. Naiman, to think about looking at as I recall, when we raised this issue some years ago, the uh, the contractor said there was some kind of a software fix, but they 
contended it wasn't within the scope of their contract and they would have to be paid extra money to do it. Yeah. That's know, correct. You know, how much they thought it was yeah. going to cost or, or were demanding. And, you know, I guess at the time, uh, the state board, uh, you know, there, there was a dispute about that. Um, and so it must have been a significant amount of money, but it would be interesting to as, see what as, people- As I that. recall, as I recall back then, it was like a roughly a million dollars. Yeah. And I don't, uh, and I don't remember if you know if that's right. And I obviously don't know if that's correct today. Um, but uh, I'm glad to, to see uh, uh, Alex that your your memory has not lost anything uh, over the years because that was, I think, during uh, during Vincent term number one. Um, but that's when I was not in the senior category, but I suppose I am now. So yeah, I yeah. Well, what, <laughs> yeah, but, but but I do think that um, I, I like the idea of uh, um, going back. I mean, we've basically been asking for it multiple times, and they keep putting it off. Next it's next election, David. right, right. But you know, we have a you know we have two brand new members of the board of public works, and one who's relatively new. And uh, you know, maybe they would uh, you know see this as a as a worthwhile um, as a worthwhile expenditure. Um, as far as the security cameras go, I would guess that there'd be a huge expense if we didn't use public schools cameras because every public school has their own cameras, and I believe that the drop boxes are being placed in places where there are existing cameras on them. Um, and so I don't know whether the issue is whether we need our own cameras or whether we just need to have better access to the video itself. And I don't know whether that's possible without having our own cameras. Because um, I, I personally don't have an issue with the idea that more people have access to it. Um, but I, I, I don't know whether, uh, you know, we would have to establish our own entire system in order to in order to do that. Kevin may be able to answer that question because he was involved with those security uh, cameras. I, I think it's going to be difficult to do under federal law for certain privacy issues with students. Well, so, right, I mean, but I, I mean, I, if you're relying on the security cameras from the school in general, they, that's integrated into their whole system. If you've got a camera that's focused on the box, there can't be any privacy concerns about whoever comes up to the box, whether they go to school there or not. You know, I mean, it, this, this is an important issue to know who is approaching the boxes, what they're putting in there, especially, uh, you know, in, a, a, after, uh, you know, nine o'clock in, in the evening and before six in the morning. Um, there's There's got to be a better way, because right now, effectively, the video data is unavailable. You can't get it. Well, and can I add to that, Kevin, I think that we went over this in prior board meetings. Can you guys hear me, by the way? Yes. Okay. When I had asked you about the, or I had asked about the ability to review in live time what was happening on the security cameras, and that was deferred to a closed session, I think. <clears throat> but I understand there are multiple issues with the integrity of um, the whole security camera on the drop boxes, which will be a bigger discussion for later. Is that correct? I was not aware of integrity issues with the drop boxes. I was aware of con of concerns about um, access to the video. But are are you are you suggesting that you think there there were issues with? Um, no, I'm wrapping it all together. And maybe integrity was uh, poor yeah, choice. It wasn't an integrity issue. It was just yeah, uh, it, Kevin can talk uh, about uh, this. I, he I I can certainly explore it with uh, Stephanie Williams at the general right. counsel's office. I, 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 I don't know what their answer would be. I mean, Alex, you raise a valid point. Diane, you do too. I just don't know how keen Montgomery County Public Schools are going to be about us, the Board of Elections, putting cameras on their school property monitoring that are going to capture students coming in and out of the school. I, I kind of have an idea of what the response is going to be to that. Yes, yes, yes. Well, and, and again, Kevin, what I would suggest is that the, the cameras should be focused on the drop boxes at the correct angle. And right. so in a way that you're, you're not sort of filming who's going in and out of school, but you're looking at who's approaching the drop box. That's right. the key. I don't think it's possible, Alex, as a technical issue. Elise, your hand is up. Are, do you have a question or sometimes? 
Elise. She has to be unmuted. One second. This was asked Jerry. No, she, I, I think Jerry can yes. hear. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have concerns about 11, the permanently removing people for the, I guess, sort of two strikes um, if you vote provisionally and just how that is administered or they let, you know, how do we let them know in advance that they've been removed or, um, you know, how do we pick two? Um, it just seems kind of arbitrary um, for me and, um, you know, we're trying to figure out their intent. Does this mean that they don't want to be on? I mean, do we notify them, give them a chance to say yes or no? I mean, I don't know. It just seems complicated to me. Yeah, thank you. My, my, my reaction to that is that I definitely see the complications uh, because we require confirmation of many other things like address changes, et cetera. And maybe this one is a little too complicated to put on this list and deserves to be looked at more carefully before we yes, right. send it anywhere. Alex? Um, just, and I won't take up too much more time. I have concerns about numbers eight, uh, 12, and 13 particularly. I don't think I would support those the way they exist now. Um, and you know, I, I can go into my reasons if, if people want, but um, number six, it's an interesting idea. I think that there would be some difficulty uh, in contract negotiations getting uh, the, the, uh, the vendors to agree to that and how it would actually be enforced. Um, but uh, I guess I, you know, it'd be interesting to know, and I don't know, Mr. Naiman, if, if, if he has any information on this. It, it says here it frequently took more than two weeks how frequently and how did you how did you know that how did you find that out i found that out because at the time during the uh the course of the election and perhaps boris or allison can give us extra insight into how that works our staff had a uh, significant uh data retrieval capability for where ballots were um in in the mail that would be mailed to people and when they and when they arrived and my understanding at the time that it was checked was that the average uh time frame was 17 days um and if it's the average was 17 days uh that suggests to me that you know yeah. ha half of them took longer than 17 days um now that may have been at a particular moment in time because i did not ask for a deep dive on the data at that you know at that point but that's uh, that's where that came from and my reaction you know in terms of um you know i think we have to find out what is causing those delays if it is you know if it is taking that long because um it's hard for us to encourage people not to do web delivered ballots which we know we have a lot of concerns about and a lot of different fronts if when they order the US mail ballot, they have to wait and wait and wait and wait much longer than you would expect if you were, you know, uh, expecting something to you know, arrive in the mail. So anyway, that was the um, that, that was where where that came from. Um, yeah, that that's basically it. I mean, at number eight, again, I, I think early voting and election day voting really should be distinct and they should not be merged or mixed together. I think there's a lot of problems that could occur with that. Uh, people need to, if, if we can improve the sample ballot, fine, but people need to pay attention to where their polling place is um, and, and take appropriate action. In my view, again, that's just, that's, that's my brief comment about that. Number 12, um, you know, I think young people have an ability to get a state issued photo ID without having a driver's license. I'm not sure why that wouldn't be um, the best solution um, uh, to prove their residence. And number 13, um, again, I, I'm not sure how often people vote, vote in the wrong party ballot, but again, you, you should know what party you belong to and you should be voting in, the, in, in that primary. I'm not sure that there's a real problem there that needs to be corrected, but that's my view. Um, and I'm, yeah, can I can yeah. I just wait? Can I weigh in on that, Alex? Yeah, having, yeah, <clears throat> having been required to recently renew my driver's license, I was surprised to see. <clears throat> excuse me. 
and the online services that you can free of charge right there instead of getting your driver's license, get an ID issued to you. For, so there is an ability offered by um, the government to provide that and maybe we could roll that in to that proposal. Think well, about. I was certainly not intending to create a uh, requirement for ID to vote for only the youngest voters. So uh, I would I would definitely not go down that route. Anyone who's been to the Motor Vehicle Administration knows that even for free, it's a significant investment of time, energy, effort, et cetera. And um, and this, these are for people who may have spent their entire lives living in the same house in Montgomery County. So uh, the idea that uh, that they go through that extra hoop strikes me as uh, you know as as um, a bit much. Um, but you know, like, like I said, if if these are things that are going to be controversial, we don't have to include them because my goal was to come up with a list that would be more consensus. I do have a question for you, Alex, which is, um, I I don't think I proposed to not you know to not require people to vote in the party primary that they're supposed to vote in. What I proposed was that when they don't, that their ballot for the nonpartisan office that is on both ballots, Democratic and Republican, would be counted. And to me, that's the same thing as when we have a voter who votes out of their district and we count their vote for statewide office and countywide office, but we don't count their vote for the district office where they don't live. In this instance, we're talking about an office that is a countywide office and it appears on both the Democratic and Republican primary ballots. All I'm saying is, is that if I vote the wrong party primary, no, I'm not. I'm not advocating an open primary. I'm not. I'm not advocating that we let people choose which primary they vote in. I'm just saying that rather than our throwing out all of their vote, um, we would include their nonpartisan vote. Now, are you saying that you have a, a concern about that as well? Well, what is the, do we know what the scale of the problem is? You know, I mean, how, how many people are voting the wrong party ballot? And why we, had quite, we had quite a few. I don't know what the exact number was, but we had quite a few in the um, in the provisional ballot count in the primary. I'm sure we can we can find the, the numbers. But um, what does it matter, Alex, if it's three people? If it's three people, then our job will be that much easier because there's less duplication. But if it's. I mean, what's the principled reason why, if I vote the wrong party ballot, my nonpartisan vote should be thrown out? Well, I guess it would be that it, are we treating these kind of voters differently than somebody who voted a wrong ballot in any other kind of way? Um, I don't think we are. I think we're treating them the same. If I vote, if I vote the wrong district, you know, if I vote in District 20, when I live in District 16, my vote in District 20 won't count, but my vote for county executive isn't thrown out. Is that correct? Is that how it's done now? That is exactly how it's done now. Yeah, that's that's correct. Yeah. So is there- It would be an in part. So is there some uh, reason why the, the, then the wrong party ballot is required to have the entire ballot thrown out? Was there some reason for that distinction between that and voting in the wrong precinct that anybody knows of? I don't know of it. That's why I proposed this. Admittedly, I may be more sensitive to this subject, having served on the Board of Education, you know, earlier in my life. But uh, to me, I couldn't think of any reason um, other than, you know, yes, there would be some slight burden to us to duplicating the ballots. But we'd be duplicating the school board races only. Alex, I, I don't know the state's rationale for uh, why they don't, when, there was an election cycle where we actually did do that. We did duplicate for um, uh, the school board many, many years ago, because I remember Ms. Lamone um, directing me to appear before the state board to explain why we didn't follow their, their directive in that regard. Um, so I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure what the rationale is. I can certainly find out, speak to Nikki and see what, what their justification is for it. Uh, I, I would just say, Kevin. I, I would like to. I would like to hear their rationale in order to 
Paul, on either side of this. Sorry, David, go, go ahead. I, I was just going to say that if, Kevin, if you were summoned to appear because we did this, and after that, you still don't remember what their rationale is, it obviously wasn't very good. It wasn't. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't necessarily find it compelling. Right. Um, they, I mean, they, basically, it sounds like they're saying follow our rules. And I understand that. We have a statewide system. So if we have to go to them and say, we think you should change your rules, then let's go to them and say, we think you should change your rules. But, but um, you know, um, we had, um, you know, we've had some pretty close school board races on occasion. And, um, and, and, you know, we should think hard before we're, you know, we're throwing out school board votes without a reason. And you're saying, Kevin, there was a cycle where we actually did um, count the votes for school board? Oh, yes. Huh. Yeah, there was. So wh why did we do it then, but we haven't done it since? Oh, because the state well, board. They told us because we can't. because the, state, the state board is very unhappy that the, the board did it. Yes. So we yes. got creative and. Uh, I mean, I'd like to I'd like to just hear their rationale and then we have a solid opinion. Number 16, with regard to judges, that would require a constitutional amendment. That's Sussman versus State Board of Elections. State Board of Elections. It's a case from 2000 and I don't know what it was, six or something. So um, I, I guess my question would be, um, where are we in terms of the things that we can agree on? Because I realize that there may be um, a category where we can't, but the goal was for many of these, I think, were things that we all kind of talked about. Um, I just wanted to see if 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 there are things in uh, you, you know in that um, in that category. Um, and, and and it was not intended to put people you know uh, on the spot. Uh, I definitely wasn't intending for us to get into a, a whole long debate about voter ID. Um, you know, uh, which which I'm sure is a much longer debate and probably one that needs to be held at the legislative level as opposed to ours. Um, although we could have a, a, a spirited conversation without being able to actually uh, affect the result. Um, but um, I, I, my thought was, was that for the things that we can get fixed, we're much more likely to get them fixed in 2023 than in 2024. So if we want to get something fixed in time for the 2024 election with the primary coming in April of 2024, now is the time. Uh, and, 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 and in reality, a month or two ago was really the time. Um, how, about, David, yeah. how about everybody has the list. If they send us the list and which one they agree, which one they don't agree. So instead of talking now. Well, how the problem with that is that then um, we have a combination of how do we inform the public because we're supposed to make these decisions in public and how do we do it in a timely way that affects our legislators. I, I was thinking that if we spend another minute or two, we could eliminate the ones, I'm not even saying we have to vote on them. If, if there are certain ones that people want to pull, right. we, let's pull yeah. them. And then, okay. and then and then and then let's and then let's see what we're what we're left with. Um, okay. You know what, David? To make it easy, I go from number one and I say the number, and whoever agree I put their hand up if it's majority, something like that. Much much. I, 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 Madam President, I was going to suggest that we might even be able to be even quicker than that because I know that we want to want to move on. Okay. I, I think that a number of members have already expressed themselves. And let me see. I'm not sure if I completely uh, committed to memory the ones that Alex expressed, but let me see if I can pull that together. Because I believe that, uh, first of all, let's take the one about the, the judges off. If it requires a constitutional amendment, we're, you know, we're, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to do that as part of this process. So that's number uh, number 16. Alan suggested moving num the number 17 to number one and um, to uh, communicate with the state board about um, both number, basically the current number one and number 17. Um, why don't we add the suggestion I made about the uh, rejecting parts for the wrong party ballots to our letter to the state board and ask them for their rationale in the same letter? 
So the letter would be um, asking about the uh, requiring that it be an in ink. It would be um, it would be asking about the um, uh, the seven candidate limit on a page, and it would be asking about why we are being told to reject in full the wrong party ballots. Um, and then um, I believe that uh, now the next one that uh, Alex expressed concern about was number six. Is that right? Yeah, only that I, I just think, I don't know, that that's going to be a difficult issue. I think contractors are going to push back on that, whether you're going to get enough bidders who would agree to this two business day deadline. What I believe it may already be there. And I guess that's a question I, I would ask if Boris knows the answer. Yeah. Okay. My, under my understanding that current uh, state board requirement from the vendor is to have uh, mail, vote by mail packets in the USPS mail stream within 48 hours from the time the data was submitted to the vendor. So, so the question would be, so, you know, for example, is there some contractual remedy they have if they don't miss or they blow the deadline, especially, you know, by, by 15 days? Or is there some other, or is there some other way to figure out why it's taking as long as it is if it's not the vendors doing? Um, and I don't know what the answer to that is, but is that something for us to ask the state? Or I mean, what's the what's the best approach to that? Because I, I personally believe we have to do something about how long it, it takes for those ballots to arrive. I, we probably need more information about what what the state thinks why it's happening. Right. You know, so why don't we add that to our inquiry of the state? Would that yes work for everybody? That, that we should do that. Okay. Which question, which, which question was question it? Six. It was it was it was number it was number six would be yes. that would be in the category of ask the state. Yes. All okay. Right. All right. Now Alex said that he does not like number eight, the idea of opening early voting centers on election day. Um, I, 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 I thought it was a, a, a way to solve this problem, but I can definitely see how it would be controversial. We can certainly kind of punt that to another day. Yeah, and, I would recommend and, that. And, 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 then we, and then we also um, can look at uh, Barbara Sanders' letter where she talks about mm -hmm. um, um, some things that we, that we could be doing. Right. I, I, didn't, I didn't hear any objections to number 10 or number 11. I'm sorry, number 11. Nine. Number nine or number 10, I apologize. Number 11, um, Elise was suggesting that we shelve that one and look at that later. Um, number 12, um, it sounded like um, there was some uh, opposition to number 12. I guess that's also one to shelve. Is that, uh, is that what I was hearing? Yeah, because I've got, you guys didn't like my suggestion. <clears throat> Well, I like it. I like it. I like it as a suggestion to tell people of its availability. Yeah. I would love to put in our sample ballot that says to people, if you don't have a driver's license and you don't have a uh, a utility bill, that we suggest that you get this card. I just don't know if I think it should be a requirement for voting, but we can talk about yeah. that one separately. Yeah. Alex, what do you want to do with number thirteen? Oh, I'm sorry. Is, is thirteen we're gonna we're gonna add to our letter to the state? Better to the state, right? Okay. Um, so I, I didn't hear anyone object to number 14 or number 15. Yeah. Is that is that correct? Right. Um, no, right. and I, I guess I don't have an objection to it. I mean, I know that the longstanding rationale has been to preserve the integrity of the secret ballot. I, I don't know if anyone can think of a reason why we should continue to reject them. Is there... Could there be a situation where having somebody put their name on it is, you know, is not a good thing that we should discourage that? Well, I don't know. I'm not really opposed to it, I guess, but. Um. I, this is my concern with just throwing this one out wholesale. There are a lot of different, unless you are limiting this only to a mark that is a signature, because I would hate to open this up to requiring more objective or subjective, I'm sorry, um, thinking and determining a voter intent if we just allow, because we've seen a lot of crazy stuff on these ballots. 
I, I am I am proposing to suggest that it it's only the signature I'd support. Well, are you saying, Diane, you think it's only the signature, meaning that we only prohibit the signature or we only allow the signature? How about we only allow the signature if it matches the envelope it came no, in? Why, 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 why? I mean, I, 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 we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what was and was not an identifying mark simply because the statute says it, not because any of us believed that someone was using a mark in some way that was anything other than innocent. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, I guess I'm trying to understand. I realize that there was a time when people thought that if you had an identifying mark on a ballot, that somehow it was a message to a candidate that you were supporting them or something along those lines. But we don't, you know, those ballots we don't show the the identifying marks to the world so the candidates never see them so in um, other word, and and in other words maybe then the scanner would make the determination no 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 i am not suggesting the scanner would throw it out because of a stray mark i'm suggesting that if i put my initials if i put my name if i had we had one voter who had commentary on every candidate on the ballot none of that should just none of that should disqualify the voter if their vote is valid um and and i thought i mean we spent a lot of time on that with you know again if we can't come up with the rationale for why it's a problem then why are we keeping it you, you, you know um, I mean, I, I, I don't believe that we've heard that there's, um, you know, that there's a, a, a problem with that. The only problem we face, we've had some really tear jerking stories from people who are apologizing for how poorly they filled out their ballot and then they sign their name to it and we have to throw it out. Uh, and, and, they, and, and they're, you know, elderly people who have trouble you know, seeing the circles. Um, and I don't know about you, but I don't want to do that in other election. Um, and, and I don't want to have to try and figure out whether they're signing their name or not. Do we have to make this decision today? Only, only if you want to try and do it this year for the 2024 election. If you, you know, I mean, what's so hard, Diane? Well, well, David, I, I think that, you know, the point here was to try to find what we could agree on, not to see if we can debate and convince our colleagues to withdraw their objections or whatever. I mean, it's it's sufficiently controversial that this kind of rule has been around a long time. Maybe it makes sense to do it, but we should probably be efficient with our time and focus on what we, without any hesitation can agree on. And well, let, well, well let me let me just say that um, when I suggested that we remove the things that were controversial, I was not suggesting that if it requires five minutes of conversation that we just remove it because we are in the position where we're already late for anything we want to do. <clears throat> and I personally, you don't have to agree, I personally believe that the fact that something has been around a long time, given how much voting has changed over, over that, that time period, does not automatically mean that it would be controversial to eliminate it. And I guess my question for you would be, who do you know that thinks that this is an actual problem, that people marking their ballot, even if they write their full name, who do you know that thinks that's a problem? Um, and I, you know, I don't think that I haven't heard that anyone who believes, you know, who believes that's a that's a problem. Now, you know, the fact that it hasn't, you know, that we that we've had this rule on the books. I mean, we've been complaining about this rule as long as I can remember. But how often does it really happen? How often even did it happen in 2022? It wasn't that often. We had other things like commentary. How, 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 how often does it have to happen for us to empower those voters? We had well, 10, 15 at least. You, you, you and I have yeah. a different view on that. You know, I mean, changing the law to cover five ballots where this was a problem, you know, I, I don't know. But look, if it was, else it was more elected, than five and, it, it, and it's every election. And, um, and, and, uh, you know, um, but you I, mean, right. David, this was I, I think you're right that we have a different, we have a different view because apparently, um, you know, to me, if we are trying, if we are restoring someone's vote and there's no reason not to restore it, 
if there's one person that's sufficient for me okay you if there's a reason not to David, do it that's different david we can educate the voter not to sign the paper the ballot we say David, it in we every we say it in every sample ballot and we probably have for 10 years and we still get them sample ballot yes but we can educate them educate the people don't read the sample the ballot from, uh, sure. we've uh, been uh, we've been educating them what is the problem we're trying to solve I'm saying that this is not a big issue, I, like five, six ballot. So maybe we can put something in the sample ballot that said, please do not sign the ballot. We already do. Ballot. We okay, already do. That until the public find out if, if they continue doing it, then we won't count. So which is we are not counting. All right, well, it sounds like, uh, I mean, I, I don't know if we need a vote. It sounds like some of you all don't want to eliminate the rejection of ballots for identifying marks. Right. Um, and and uh, I, At I, this think, time. I think I think that's very short sighted. Um, you know, um, at this time means the 2024 election because, uh, you know, we're proposing this later will not be, you know, the, the, the bill <laughs> introduction deadline. I believe is this week. And if, you know, this week or next week, we will not be meeting again before that, you know, before that happens. So um, I'm disappointed, but I, I understand. Yeah. So, um, all right, so we're not including number 14. So let me tell you the ones that I think we are including. Can I add, can I add one that is not on here? Which you can is, try, sure. We have talked about this during the canvas on a number of occasions this this list was so thorough that it escaped my attention until this discussion that we had not added it that i had not suggested it i and i'm not prepared to give a <clears throat> a concise description in one sentence but basically something i've mentioned before to require um penalties to attach penalties to misuse of the Dropbox, similar to penalties attached to misusing the US Postal Service. How many times has it happened in Montgomery County? How would we know? I, How would we know? Oh, we'd know. There are Dropboxes. You don't think we'd be told if something happened to the Dropbox? I'm, I'm not talking about the physical Dropbox. I'm talking about using it with fraudulent activity. Well, how would um, that be? All, all I can say to that is, is that if your standard for identifying marks is how often does it happen, we have many more identifying marks than we have fraudulent ballots using the Dropbox. How would you possibly know? How would you? Well, it's a standard. I, I mean, I mean, why, why, why is why is fraud why, why, why is fraud by Dropbox different than any other kind of fraud? Voter fraud is illegal, no matter what method of voting you use. I think it's one more measure of voter integrity that is important with the ballot drop box. I, I put it in the same category of security cameras. Why do we have security cameras? Well, we, there's if, a big difference the, between- nothing untoward ever happens. There, there, there's a big difference between adding a criminal statute and adding a camera. And even adding a camera, as we discussed today, is quite complicated. Okay, so I threw um, it up. It's so, controversial. I accept that if if there's no other discussion. Well, Di Diane, I also think it's already covered. I mean, I, I think it's generally covered by anything that's tampering with an election. Is I mean, so if you were to do something to do something to a Dropbox, I think that's. I mean, I, that's why I don't think it would. Quite frankly, I I think it's already in the law. But okay, yeah, I'm not talking about the physical structure of the Dropbox. Mm. I'm talking about in the channel of delivery, the oh. process of using that method of voting, that there be penalties attached specifically to Dropbox, fraudulent activity in the course of the mail, like there is with you improperly using US Postal Service. I got it on the record. We can revisit it if it's 
obviously it sounds very controversial. I, so I, yeah. I just think it requires, a, a, if you're going to write a criminal statute, I think it requires much more thought as to what is already on the books versus what isn't. Voter fraud is already illegal. It is illegal no matter which method of voting you use. Ale. Yeah, I, I was agreeing with Kevin that there already is statute to prevent uh, any kind of tampering with election equipment. I'm not talking and, about and, equipment. And I'm not aware of any uh, incidents of any fraud, but I, I mean, we, we saw a good 10 or 15 signatures uh, on, on ballots that were just tossed. People had worked long and hard on, on their voting. We couldn't accept them under the statute. <clears throat> so um, would, would you like me to read the numbers that I think are left? Yeah, David, you skipped over, I think, seven, which obviously I don't see how that could be controversial. We never meet it anyway. Right. Well, um, seven, I was seven. I was considering included in what we would what we'd agree to. What I have is um, one, two and three, four, five and seven, um, nine and ten and 15. And then 17 would be added to um, uh, going to the uh, you know, to the state as as would the suggestion about uh, the asking them for rationale about the rejecting fulls for the school board votes. And I have one seventeen six thirteen. These are go to state. I'm sorry. Say that again, Nahid. One, one six thirteen seventeen. Yeah, that's right. Um, yes, I, that that's correct. So wait, can you, I'm sorry, just for uh, my apologies, point of clarification for me. What are you saying about number 16? Is that the judges? No. 16 we're taking out. No, I'm sorry. Um, like 16, no, 16. Is I up. Took, I, I'm sorry, my numbers may be wrong. I already took out the judges because, as Kevin said, if it, if it requires a constitutional amendment, we're not going to propose it. All right, yeah. thank you. I needed that. Um, what, 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 I, what, what, I, what, I, what I meant to include, and, I, and, I'm, and I, I think it's number 15, but I'm not certain, is the statutory authority for delivering the mail-in ballots to the polls. Correct. That is 15. Yeah. Okay. So I would move. I, I, I would move that we endorse the, the the numbers that we just discussed. And the oh, wait a minute, wait, wait, fifteen. <clears throat> so you're saying people don't have to put the mail in in the mail or a drop box? They can bring it to the location. Well, Diane, we already know that they did in 2022. Yeah, um, but weren't we worried about the security of that? Where are they going to put them? Who's going to take them? I mean, there's no security camera on it. Uh, well, the, I mean, the, I have some problems with that. I, it, I goes in, it goes into the polling place. It goes into a bag that the election judge has. As, 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 as do provisional Alan, ballots. Alan, that sounds great in theory, but in practice, which I saw. I was at many places and they brought these things and nobody knew what to do with them. First of all, they're not supposed to be walking around in the polling place looking for the box. They didn't have a, lock, a locked bag to put it in. Um, people are supposed to go in. The only reason they're supposed to be there is if they get in line and are told they can come in and then they go up to the poll book, book and then they're certified to be able to walk around in the area. I have big security issues with this one. I would absolutely want to Hold uh, on. Uh, well, explain the bag. How, how it me. operates. Diane, let me let me ask a question. Um, to me, there's a significant difference between saying that there were operational issues because we had never done it before. 2022 was the first time that we did it, and saying that the system is incapable of being done in a secure fashion. And to me, um, the biggest issue with it was was that I wasn't sure if there was a statute that called for it. So the proposal is to have a statute that calls for it. And I would like to know, how is this any different than the security of provisional ballots? Because provisional ballots are also put into a bag at the, at the, at the polling place. 
I'll tell you how, that goes to my first point. When you're filling out a provisional ballot, you've already gone to the poll book and there's some, and you're signing something for a provisional ballot. You're not just a free agent walking in the area. This is just for me, a security issue. And if we are going to allow people to now be bringing mail and ballots for crying out loud, why don't they vote in person if they're gonna to come to the place? If we're gonna allow right. them to just bring it in and drop it off, I, I, I just think that opens up a whole new universe of, of unsecure territory. Alex. But, but Di Di Diane, it's already occurring. Well, yeah, and I don't think it should. <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I don't think we've had on, Diane. An Alex, autopsy on, on this issue. Alex would like to talk. Go ahead, Alex. Uh, Madam President, I do share some of uh, Diane's concerns about this. I, I think it could be problematic to have people returning, at least in large numbers, mail and ballots to polling places. I spoke to um, uh, the state board chairman about what he thought of, of, of this. I guess they took a vote sometime last year um on this issue and he believes that there is statutory authority in the statute that allows the return of a mail-in ballot to an election official and i guess they determined uh after some debate and, and briefing from the state board staff that you know poll election judges polling workers are election officials even if they're temporary uh so they believe there was statutory authority i i haven't looked at the, the statutory language specifically, uh, but that's that's what they believe. So now, is there is there room to clarify that? I don't know. I think yeah, there was this secure bag that they had there. I I'm not sure how widespread of an issue this was, but um, apparently the state board believes there's already authority to do it, and that's that's what they use to justify um, directing all of the local boards to do this in 2022. All right. Do do you guys prefer that it be taken off the list? I mean, it's already being done. If they think they already have authority, then you know. Yes. The um, story is thirteen that Kevin was going to check with the state board and see what they're. What? I'm question. sorry. I couldn't hear. Allison, Allison can you repeat I that, please? I, I was just wondering if it was the same category. I believe that Kevin was going to check with the state board on their legal rationale for something else. And perhaps this is in that category as well. I, I would rise this to a higher level of concern, at least for me. Who's the higher level? And, pardon me? Who, who are they? The higher level. In, in my hierarchy of concerns, I put this at a higher level yeah. than just asking them what they use to justify. Di 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 it. Diane, what, Diane, what do you want to do? Promote it. What, I'm, what, maybe I'm misunderstanding. I've got to apologize. I am having some delay with hearing all of you, so bear with me, please. D Diane, it sounds like at the moment we have a few different possible ways of addressing this issue, including not addressing it at all. One of the options that uh, that uh, that was on this list was to uh, propose a statute that codifies what was what is already being done. And I understand you have concerns about that. Then there was an option that was um, that was proposed that uh, basically says that the that the state board believes they already have the authority, and therefore that would be the in the do nothing category. And then Alison was, suggesting that another possibility is to ask the state board to explain what their authority is. Um, and it sounded like you were saying that you wanted to do something further. Um, and I don't know if you're saying that you want to eliminate this uh, ability of people to come to the polls. That is probably outside of our domain if the state board has already required it. Right. I, um, don't, I don't know how we get, I agree. Uh, thank you for you know, elucidating all that. I, I would not, I have enough concerns that if this were to be allowed, that there be particular provisions on how this process has to be handled. I, I just think on its face, it is 
kind of a wide open, um, you know, wide open territory. I, I don't, I don't agree with that Simon. assessment, but I don't know I, how I, we, how do we get there to ensure that we're going to have safeguard safeguards that would, I think, answer my concerns, which I think are reasonable. Okay, let me let me suggest that we have a conversation about it on another day, and not include it in our list of potential legislative items, because it sounds like we want to get a much better sense as to operationally how it would work. And it sounds like we don't have consensus that we want to do anything legislative, okay. and um, and 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 then we can go from there. Boris, I can't tell if the look on your face is one that suggests that you have something to say. Uh, I just wanted to to bring up to the board that uh, for the 2020 general election, we collected uh, 2,110 ballots through eight days, 14 early voting centers and 231 polling place. Yeah, those were collected in the yellow bags that were kept. 20, in 2020. Secured yellow yeah. bags. Sorry? How many were there? Here. 2,110 collected through early voting and election day. Wow. A, people, a people who walked in with a mail and ballot and just and dropped it off, correct? They, no. they have to communicate with the election official, yeah, we use yellow colored bag that is equivalent to orange provisional bag, which is secured. It has, it's not open at the polling place. It's open only here once it's returned to the board at night. You can't put your hands in it. Yeah, no, my, my concern is everything I just said, walking in and having to drop it off somewhere. And I've been this last cycle, I've been in polling places where these things have shown up and to a person, the staff there was unsure what to do, where it goes. And it just, we're not supposed to have people walking around in the voting area if they're not properly checked in. So at the first step, it's a big security violation in my mind that I would like to see addressed. Madam President, I suggest that we put that on a future agenda. Yes, I think um, so. And, to... and, and perhaps we can um, vote on the remaining items. The, um, one uh, the ones on which I think we all agree. Um, so I'm going to read them again. Just 1, 6, 13, 17 for state, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 9, 10, uh, 15, I don't know whether you No, 15, 15 is out. 15 is out, okay. Can, can, you, can you read that again? You said it was two. Three, four, right. five, seven, seven, nine, ten. Right, okay. I agree. Yep. I, move, I move that we endorse what Nahid just said. 17, I guess. I second right. that. Oh, 17, we were going to. One, six, 17, yeah, 17, part, 17 is going to be part of what we communicate to the state. Not something state. we thought needed legislation. No, no, okay. Right. So, so here it is. These are we agree, and the rest of them we will talk next. Uh, well, we we moved and seconded, but I think that it's time yeah, for debate. Alan. And Alan has his hand up. Yeah. <clears throat> never mind. Oh, okay. Alan, he was. <laughs> he said never mind. Well, I, I was, okay. Well, I'm just going to plan a, a deception nine dash five zero four. Uh, a voter may return a vote by mail ballot to a local board, one by mail, two in person during regular office hours, or three through a duly authorized agent in accordance with section B of this section. And then a voter may designate a duly authorized agent to return a vote by mail ballot. The point is election judges are duly authorized agents of ours. They can receive and have been receiving Ballots that were would otherwise be mailed or put uh, in the yeah, drop. I'm not. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'm yeah. not sure I, I don't know that that section applies, Alan. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't. I don't know that I agree because for our other agents, they have to sign a form so that they're designated. You know, uh, I, I'm not sure I agree that, that that's the authority. Okay, I'm going to read it again. That's the last time. One six thirteen seventeen for state. Two, three, four, five, six, nine, ten. 
no, five, no, seven, we, we, nine, ten. Yeah, six was only five, a first row go around, right? And and I moved it, and Diane seconded it. And, and Alex, yes. you're you're voting on this. I am. Who's voting? Alex, yeah, I, I think I, I think Ami may have lost uh, power. She lost. She lost connectivity, and so she sent oh. me a text. Oh. Well, seven, okay. Here we go, Alex. I just applauded Glenn. Hey, Alex, does that mean that we want to extend debate because you now have more to say? <laughs> Alex, would, Alex, would you like to second that motion and <laughs> Oh, no, no. That, Who that made the motion? I, I did. The motion or the number which I read? Yes. Alex, second it? Uh, okay. uh, Diane, Diane. Diane already seconded it. Already seconded. A couple times. <laughs> Let's let's Alex for a change. Second, I, I offered no, it. No, no, Nahid, Nahid. <laughs> Diane said she wanted to, and Alex said he didn't. So um, I'm not quite sure why we would okay, have Alex second in. Those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Oppose. Any oppose. Okay. Thank you so much. That's okay. that's the end of this. Start okay. Thank you all. Yeah. Now we're going to the uh, board, next board compensation, which we talk about them. Any other new business before we go to this one? Man, I have to turn some lights on. Uh, and I have to find my, I have to find my proposal. And while David's doing that, maybe I'll just, I'll just point out, I, the board traditionally has because obviously no one has been interviewed and the selections have not been made for the future board. They, they set the, what the future board's compensation will be because under Maryland law, the board cannot affect its own compensation. So uh, it's always been set by the board for the new incoming board. And I'm, I'm ready to make a motion if, uh, if that's in order, Madam President. Okay, go ahead. Uh, David, are you? Let me talk. The beginning when me, me and David, we talk in the budget committee, we went to 14 and six, uh, seven, 14, 16. Right. So which one are you going to make? That was um, I, um, no, my, no, my, my motion is what I said in my uh, email that I sent the board shortly before the meeting, um, which is a, a combination of things. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll read it first, and then I'd be happy to uh, to speak to it. Yes, please. Um, I am, I am, and, and again, I want to reiterate what Kevin said. We, this is for the salary and the canvas fee for the board that takes office in June of 2023. And none of us know at this point whether we will be part of that or not. Um, my motion would be to set the annual salary for the president of the board at $17,000 for the secretary of the board at $16,000 for all the other board members, including the substitute members at $15,000 and to pay for, for Canvas participation, $25 per Canvas meeting for remote participation and $75 per Canvas meeting for in-person participation. So that's my motion. I second it. Discussion? If I may, um, Madam President, um, first of all, I want to um, to thank Nahid for uh, working with me on the initial proposal that uh, that she mentioned uh, on on this um, that uh, that she and I worked on together. We also then um, you know heard from uh, individually uh, some some feedback from others. Um, including um, Diane with the very good point that uh, in figuring out the salaries, um, I had focused on inflation between the last time we did this, which was in July of 2018 and January of 2023, and had not taken into consideration the fact that this, uh, you know, this salary is going to last through 2027, and there's obviously going to be inflation between now and then. Um, in addition to that, um, I think um, by 
changing the canvas fee from a flat fee to a per meeting fee and distinguishing between remote participation and in-person participation, I think we all experienced how much harder we work for in-person participation, but we also want to encourage in-person participation. I know none of us are on the Board of Elections for the money. We are all grossly underpaid. That includes our staff. Um, they are also grossly underpaid, in my opinion. Um, but um, it's a start, and um, and I think it's a, a it's a reasonable proposal that takes into account the change in the cost of living um, over time. Madam President, I have a question. Yeah, uh, Lisa has a I just question. have a question uh, for the board for clarification purposes. Um, does recount fall under Canvas? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. In, in the in the past, we have been compensated the same for the recount yeah. as we do for another. Correct. I was just right. asking for clarification yes. if it's on the record. Yes. 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 And um, yes, my, uh, a recount meeting would be would be the same as a as a canvas meeting. Any other question before we attack this? Does this have to be approved by the oh. the state or the no. uh, county council, or is it no? Okay. No. This, this is the right? This Lisa, is the, how, how that. Uh, we submit something to OHR for the change to the board member salary, and the stipend doesn't go through OHR. What is the current compensation for the canvas, including the recount? Is it seven fifty? Is a flat fee. flat fee per each occurrence, each case? Right, for, right. For a primary yeah. and for and, a general. And Alex, if you were to, what I did was I added inflation twice. Essentially, I added the 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 inflation since twenty eighteen to get to today, and then. I did it again, and then I divided by roughly 20 because I think we met 18 times. Uh, you know, actually, I, in that you know in that neighborhood, uh, and that came to 50 dollars a meeting, and yeah. so that's why I went with 75 in person, 25 remote. Is you know yeah. av averages out to 50. Right. Yeah. Okay then. Uh, those in favor of uh, David's motion, please raise your hand. Opposed? No. Pass. Thank you. Uh, any other uh, new business before we go to old business? An action item? Okay, we go to old business. Action item. Lisa, anything? Director. Uh, the staff will look for the documentation that was submitted to also solicitation of CTCL funds as requested for the next board meeting. Yeah. And uh, it's on us to, uh, to provide a detailed explanation of public data that is collected and used for water registration purposes. Any other action item you guys want to add? Who, who is going to be the drafter okay. of the letter to the state that we just talked about? And that's, that's the the process. Yeah. 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 Excuse process. me, David, go ahead. I'm sorry, I said, um, when we talked about our legislative items, we also included a number of items that we wanted to write to the state about. I wanted to know who is gonna be the drafter of that letter. Uh, Kevin. <laughs> I guess. Kevin, can you hear me? You, you pretend you cannot hear me. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> I, I I I have to admit I, I better check my glasses because I didn't see Kevin's hand up volunteering. <laughs> I saw. I'm, ha I'm, ha I'm happy to draft it and circulate. Thank you. I saw a poker you, face. Yeah. The other thing you want Kevin to do it before. Yeah. Yes. Question um, anyone? Kevin. Yes. Kevin. I have some figures on how long it was taking people to uh, transpose to cover over the pencil. I, okay. I got, uh, it's not scientific, but I, I'll, I'll send it to you. Okay, please okay. do it. And, and I'll, I, I'll reach I out to the, it. Uh, go ahead and please do that. And I'll reach out to the staff because obviously these ballot marking devices have become immensely popular. You know, you. Ten, four, four, six years ago, we couldn't get anyone to vote, have anyone vote on them. Now everyone wants to vote on them. Yeah. If well, they don't, no, if they don't fix every, the navigation issue, we're going to run into that not, again. Not, every, not everyone. You guys know I will never give up my wanting to use my own writing implement on my own ballot. So, okay, you, know, you can depend on me for that. All right, let's let's finish this one action item. You uh, have action item minute. As read one at a time. 
to have a motion to accept the minute of December 19, 2022. Yeah, I move we accept the minutes of December 19th, 2022 as amended, I think. Did Alan? As amended, yes. As uh, amended. Second, who seconded? Elise? I'll second. Elise, any discussion? Yes, Alan. Oh, no, no, I was okay, you wanted to second it. That's okay. All right, then those in favor say yeah, at least had her hand up first. Yeah. Hand, whatever. Opposed? <laughs> None. The second one is December 28, 2022. Do you have a motion? Um, yep, I move we accept the minutes of December 28th, 2022, and I believe we're those amended also. Yeah. Second. Yes. Alan, second. Madam President. Yes, sir. Uh, just a quick point. I I, I emailed Alan about this. I didn't see in the December 28th minutes that the time when the meeting was convened was listed, only when it adjourned. Oh. I thought it was. Oh, I didn't see your email. I'm sorry. So. Okay. The time will be, we will correct them. The, I mean, it was at 2 30 and you adjourned. Staff can put that on. Because that was a short. I, I wasn't at that meeting. But yeah, I it, it, was it, a, it was it was at 2 30. Right. According yeah. to my calendar, anyway. That was a short meeting. Just to be there. So we will add the time, right? To when it can be. To, to, to yeah. when it can be. All right, then. Those in, did we approve this one or not yet? Yeah, not we yet. had a, a second. Okay, approve with the correction, we put the date on that minute, the, in the opening time. meeting. All right, the then, thank the you. The time, yes, yes. Now, we have to go to the executive committee. Let me do that. Future meeting, February 27, 2023. That's our future meeting. So this this part, do I have a motion to get an adjourned public move, meeting? We are not coming back. Yep, I move we adjourn. Thank you, everyone. All right, thank you. Don't, don't off. Second and right, and we and we do not log off. off. So Diane, is your motion to adjourn the open session and go into executive yeah. session yes. to okay. comply with the specific constitutional, statutory, or judicially imposed requirement that pre prevents public disclosure about a particular proceeding or activity? Is that your yeah. is that your motion? Yeah. That is my motion in total. Thank, thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Don't don't shut it off. Jerry will do. We'll move everyone that. over. We'll move everybody. You have to make sure you accept the request to go into the. Uh, okay. You. Where's that link? It's it's. You're getting an invite. You'll send an invite, and you have to click on the invite to accept it. No. You're link. gonna get moved into a meeting room, Alan. Thank you. I'm I'm a little don't confused. go anywhere. We're gonna get an invite from where we are right now. Right. It'll yes. say go into a meeting room. Got it. Oh yeah, a breakout room. Breakout room. Alan Alan's probably a pro at this at this point. I, I, oh. I use Zoom three times four times a week. We just sit tight, right? Yes. Correct. Okay, because my my connectivity is freezing on me. <laughs> Okay, I need 30 seconds. Oh, no, this is, yeah, we did send this one, uh, the budget, because it's confidential. Yeah. Oh, I don't um, oh, actually, I'm going to, um, I'm going to put in my earbuds, even though it's going to lower my volume, so that I'm not broadcasting in my house. <laughs> it's okay, Jay. Oh, do you want me to print it? Do you want to print it? Waiting for Jerry to move us. Oh, okay. I don't tired or it's, it's going to meet with approval by you guys. Make sure you know that when they all that sometimes like some attachments or some people do, I don't get it. I don't know. Janet had some way of fixing it. I don't know. That's that's right. Let me let me. I mean, yeah. I, 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 I,